Good afternoon and evening. We are happy to welcome you all to the webinar about neonatal resuscitation around the world. I am Dr. Barzilai, Chairman of the Academy of Neonatology, Director of the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at the Shamir Medical Center, Israel. As a disclaimer, I would like to say that I work with TEVA as a consultant and trainer. I'm very honored and happy to open the international webinar on neonatal resuscitation around the world. This webinar will provide a better understanding of neonatal resuscitation and will introduce a new NRP, the new NRP guidelines followed by the latest European and Japanese guidelines. We are fortunate to have with us some of the world experts in this field and hopefully this will help us to take better care of our tiny patients. The webinar will be presented by three speakers Professor Myra Wyckoff from the US, Professor Charles Rohrer from the UK, and Professor Ishiyama from Japan. The webinar is organized by the Israel Academy of Neonatology and is sponsored by Teva and Kiesi. The recording of the webinar will be available after the event at the Israel Academy of Neonatology website. Before we start, please note that at the left bottom corner of the screen, there is a box for questions and you are welcome to submit your questions. We will answer your question at the end of the webinar after the presentation. Okay, it is, it is a great honor for me to introduce our first speaker, Professor Mike Myron Wyckoff, Professor of Pediatrics at UT University South Wales Medical Center at USA. Professor Wyckoff is the chair of the International Liaison Committee on the Neonatal Life Support Task Force and is a member of the AAP NRP Steering Committee. We will present the latest um, 2021 NLP guidelines. Myra, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. <clears throat> it's truly a, a joy to be here with you guys today and to share with you um, some insights into the U.S. guidelines. I'm going to um, first like to say I don't have any conflicts of interest to report to you, um, either intellect um, financially or intellectually. Um, and I want to make sure that you guys really understand how the guidelines come into being for the United States. And where that really starts is um, with the International on Resuscitation. And that group does the scientific review of the world's literature and comes up with an assessment of the certainty of that literature and a group of experts on the task force try to interpret what we think that science is telling us. And so the International Committee on Resuscitation is put together with representatives from resuscitation councils across the globe. We don't cover the entire globe, but we do have representation from Canada, the United States, some of Central and South America is represented by the Inter-American Heart Foundation. Europe is represented by the ERC. Um, South Africa sends representations. And that's really the only country within the African continent that has representation. Um, and then the Resuscitation Council of Asia represents several different countries, including Japan. And we're going to hear from Dr. Isayama about their guidelines. Um, and then as well as Australia and New Zealand. So those resuscitation councils support ILCOR, send representatives to be on the task forces. Um, the task forces cover the breadth of human life as far as how you should resuscitate, but there's a neonatal task force, a pediatric task force, um, the basic life support for adults, advanced adult life support, and then a first aid um, task force. And in addition, we're all supported by the education and implementation task force that looks at how we best educate people in the um, practices of resuscitation. So at ILCOR, the neonatal task force's goal is to provide high level systematic review of the world's resuscitation literature. And that review is to serve as the scientific backbone to the resuscitation guidelines from around the world. And we have a very systematic process that we use to do these systematic reviews, which you'll see me refer to as CIS-REVs um, moving forward. 
And at the end of those systematic reviews, we come out with a consensus on science and a treatment recommendation. And so I wanted to show you the, the process because it's, it's a very detailed process that we go through in a very systematic way. So we first start, the task force tries to select and prioritize the kinds of resuscitation questions that we think um, our users, you guys who are in the delivery room, most need to know about. And then once we put together that PICO question, which you know is the patient, the intervention, the comparison, the outcome, um, we lay that out. We then put a level of importance to the various outcomes that we think you guys care about. And then we put together a team of content experts, which always involves members of the task force, but we do ask resuscita neonatal resuscitation content experts outside the task force to help us on an individual systematic review. And we select people from all around the world to help us with that process. Um, once the team is put together and they have their PICO question, they do register it with Prospero, um, which is um, housed in the UK, but that is a, a very, um, you know, a system where you have to outline everything before you even start so that you can't change things up once you find something more interesting that you weren't counting on, et cetera. It's, it's like you're laying out your scientific process before you start and you stick to it. We then involve actual information specialists to help us fine tune our search strategies and to come up with the list of articles that exist from around the world. It is not just US centric or European centric. We're using every database that we can get our hands on to find literature from across the world. What we do need is at least an abstract available in English language or a speaker of that language to be on the task force who can help us then translate. Um, once we have the search, they do, a, they use what's called the grade process. And I'm going to teach you a little bit more about that, but they're going to, um, use that process to start looking at which articles should be included. And once they have that list of those that they're going to include, they assess for bias of the individual studies and they create what's called a grade evidence table. Um, that whole grade process is very complex. Here's a very complicated slide showing you all the different steps. But essentially, um, once you look, you're looking at risk of bias of each study that you've decided to include and looking for things like risk of bias, inconsistency, the indirectness of the data. Like if we're actually looking at a pediatric study and trying to apply it to babies, it's going to get downgraded for that. We look at imprecision. We look at publication bias and all those sorts of things can make the certainty of that evidence go down. But then there are some things that can make the certainty of the evidence even higher. So if there's a large treatment effect or there seems to be a dose response, um, then um, those kinds of things, you can upgrade the certainty of the evidence. Once you have that certainty of evidence, um, after doing your systematic review, the task force then takes that and tries to balance, you know, consider the balance of consequences and come up with the certainty of the evidence, the balance of the benefits and harms, taking into account the task force's view on values and preferences, the feasibility and equity and acceptability of that intervention to our populations, and look at other things like resource use if applicable. And then we come out with the guideline, this treatment recommendation. Um, now that's at the ILCOR level, um, and it's not just the task force who gets involved here because, oh, I'm sorry, I did want to talk about the language of grade, because I think this is really important. If you guys ever pick up one of these consensus on science and treatment recommendations and you want to read it yourself, I want to make sure you understand that the language that we use reflects the certainty of the evidence. So the strength of the recommendation will reflect to the extent to which the guideline panel is confident that the desirable out effects of the intervention outweigh the undesirable effects across the range of patients for whom the recommendation is intended. And so obviously a recommendation in grade means that everybody believes that the benefits outweigh the risks of the intervention. Whereas a weak recommendation we're saying most informed people would choose this recommendation, but we recognize that a substantial number of people might not. 
Um, and so you have this continuum of recommendations that we make that are either strongly against, weakly against, very weakly against, or very weakly for, weak for, or strongly for. And the words that we use in our treatment recommendation will reflect this. Um, if we say, if we see that the certainty of the evidence is weak or very weak, then we will say, we suggest that you do this intervention. And when you see that word suggest, you know that evidence is not very strong. If we come out and we say, we recommend you do this, that is a much stronger certainty of evidence from our evaluation. Okay, so after we um, do the, the grade evaluation and we draft this consensus on science and treatment recommendation, it's not just the task force that has some input. We post these on the ILCOR website and we put out a call for public comment. And I hope your neonatal group for Israel um, has, has um, sent this out to you because we try to send it out to all the groups that we know of um, that are involved in the neonatal care community to let them know, hey, we've posted a new consensus on science and treatment recommendation and we welcome your public comment. And really what those comments help us do is if like you're reading through it and you're confused, then if you'll put you know, what you don't understand or why it allows us to get the wording optimized before the formal publication comes out so that we can have the most clarity um, and get people to really understand what we're trying to say. Um, and then, of course, we will publish that consensus on science and treatment recommendation in, um, a, through a peer-reviewed process in one of the, the journals. Um, this is the ILCOR website. If you ever get one of these emails that says, hey, a new new thing has been posted. And, and by the way, we're going to try to start doing this with Twitter, too, although I am that's like an IT level way above me, but we have some young people who know how to use all these social media platforms. So it won't just be coming out in emails in the future, but we'll try to use some of the other strategies to notify people that we're welcoming public comment. But this is the website, it's www.ilcor.org. And um, then the publication comes out. Um, most of our publications will come out in three journals. Um, it gets published simultaneously in circulation, um, resuscitation, and then the neonatal um, co-stars also come out in pediatrics. And so our most recent publication um, from last fall came out in October of 2020. This was a summary document of the past five years, um, systematic reviews, and you can see the references um, there if you haven't had a chance yet to look at this. And these are all open access in, in these journals so that everybody across the world can try to access them, um, especially um, bodies that are trying to write guidelines. Um, these are the systematic reviews that we did and published in the last um, Consensus on Science and Treatment Recommendation document from ILCOR. We had three scoping reviews, and you can see there we looked at things like the effect of briefing and debriefing at delivery, suctioning of clear fluid, and the positive pressure ventilation devices that we use. We did 12 evidence updates. That's a look and a scan of the literature, but not as deep of a dive, and we don't do an actual meta-analysis. We're just trying to see if there's enough new literature. Um, should we just keep our current recommendation, or is it time to do a whole new detailed grade-based systematic review? And we had seven um, new systematic reviews, and those involved looking again at the evidence for intubation and suctioning for non-vigorous meconium-stained infants, the use of sustained inflation in the delivery room, oxygen use in the delivery room. We had a separate one for term and then another one for preterm. We looked at the use of epinephrine for neonatal resuscitation, use of intraosseous lines, and the impact of the duration of intensive resuscitation. So those are our most um, recent reviews. Now, here's what's, <laughs> I think, sometimes confusing to people. The ILCOR document is that backbone that then guideline writers are going to use to write their guidelines for their own country or region, um, whoever they're responsible for, for getting guidelines out. So for the United States, it is the American Heart Association in concert with the American Academy of Pediatrics who writes the guidelines for the US. And so um, American Heart Association has its own scientific um, level of evidence 
language that they use. So we have to translate the CoStar language into the American Heart language. And they have five different categories of science, certainty of science that they use. Um, and if you look here, um, th this document for the US came out simultaneously with the ILCOR document and was published in pediatrics um, last fall. Um, and then to make it even a little more complicated, you say, well, where's the NRP? The NRP is the um, education arm for the United States. And so they take the US guidelines and develop the educational program. So from the guidelines for the US, we have the 2020 algorithm, um, and we expect the United States to adopt this algorithm by January 1st of 2020. It is not very different from the 2015 algorithm. So it's not gonna be as huge of an implementation challenge um, this go round. But again, we use the neonatal resuscitation program, NRP, to be the educational arm that develops all the educational materials and the teaching program to implement the new guidelines across the United States. And again, we just um, released the program just last week on June 1st, 2021. You can now get the new NRP books um, and the, the instructors for NRP are all getting this material and getting prepared to start teaching the new classes in NRP using these materials. And we've translated for the NRP, the, the national algorithm, um, just simplified it a little bit for, for the education materials for the, for the academy. Um, and so, and um, we again expect all instructors and all hospitals in the U.S. to be using the new NRP by January 1st of 2022. Okay, so that's where it all comes from. I thought as we go through the U.S. guidelines, it's a lot of fun to kind of use a case and then we'll look for the evidence as we're trying to care for a particular infant. So let's say that we're on call at our hospital and you get notified by your OB team that there's an impending delivery of an extremely low gestational age infant. That the mom is a 36 year old G1P0 mother. She has severe preeclampsia. Membranes are intact. There's no history of trauma. Um, she's received one dose of steroids about an hour ago and her bedside sona that they quickly do does support her 27 week gestational age dates. Um, they think the baby's going to be around 820 grams. It's a female singleton. Um, they are concerned there's a category two fetal heart rate, rate tracing. They do note on that sono that the baby is in a breech position. And their plan is for a cesarean under epidural anesthesia because of the preeclampsia. So due to both the maternal and the fetal condition, delivery is going to be imminent. And I show you here a picture of uh, my hospital. And this is the old Parkland. Some people are familiar of this because this is where they took President Kennedy back in the 1960s when he was killed in Dallas. Um, and just in the last five years, we've built a beautiful new Parkland, which is enormous and hovers over tiny little old Parkland. But this is where I would be on call caring for this baby. So if we go to the top of the US guidelines algorithm, the first step is to do a team briefing and equipment check. Um, and even before that, our NRP program would of course put in a lot of education about, hey, even before you get there, you need to make sure you've done adequate antenatal counseling. Because of course, meeting with the parents before the birth of an extremely preterm baby is very important, both for them and for the team. And those discussions can be quite difficult when there's such a tiny baby. You've got a large amount of complex information you need to convey. The parents can be very stressed. And we feel it's very important that you have both national and local outcome data and to understand the limitations of each as and you bring that to the family um, in your discussion, um, in your antenatal counseling. So if necessary, you may need to consult with specialists at your regional referral center to obtain the most up-to-date information um, on outcomes and how well you can expect such babies to do. We feel in the U.S. that it's best to consider multiple factors, not just the gestational age or the birth weight, although those things are, of course, very important. 
um, but that also gender can make an impact on how well these babies do, whether it's a singleton or and in addition, whether the mother has received antenatal steroids. Ideally, you would like to have both the obstetric provider and the neonatal provider present to talk to the parents together. Um, our perspectives may differ, and may differ, and obviously those differences need to be worked out before meeting with the parents so that the information the family is receiving is consistent. Now, in the U.S., we have the um, preterm birth outcome calculator. This was based on a prospectively studied cohort of over 4,000 extremely preterm babies who were of 22 and 0 sevenths to 25 and 6 sevenths weeks. So this calculator is very specific to the tiniest babies um, who were offered active treatment at birth. And then in addition to the short-term outcomes, we have the 18 to 26 month outcomes because this data set came from the NICHD neonatal research network that has such a high rate of follow-up. Um, and it's then been validated in another cohort of over 45,000 infants um, that we looked at in the Vermont Oxford network. So that publication just came out in this past year and the calculator, it was an update to much older data. Um, so, but we now have the most current data available for people to access and use in these very preterm um, births. In addition, because our baby that I'm telling you about was a 27 weeker, that wouldn't even have been in the national calculator data. So it's good to have your own local data. And here I'm showing you some of the data that we keep collected um, and make it hard so that as the neonatologist goes to counsel families, they can have this data in their hand and say, this is how we do at our hospital. And here we have the, the gestational age in along the x-axis and you can see in the dark bars we're showing survival outcomes and then survival without severe illness and we have a long list of what we include in severe, severe illness in that definition there I and mean, so that's just one way you know to have some get a sense of how successful um, you're likely to be um, in getting this baby home to the family all right, once our counseling is done, again, that top of the algorithm, we got to prepare. We got to have a, gather a team, an adequately trained team. And here, the basic team typically in the US is going to be a neonatologist, a nurse, a respiratory therapist. And then very importantly, we're stressing in the US that you need to have somebody recording what is happening real time, what the team's interventions are, and what the baby's responses are. Some very high tech centers may choose to do this through actual video recording. Um, at my own center, um, we use a trained um, nurse who is part of the obstetric team, but if the resuscitation team is called to a high risk delivery, she immediately joins and becomes part of our team and is trained in doing this recording process on a standardized form. Um, we have to think about, since it's a 27-weeker, thermal protection. Do we have a warm environmental temperature? Is the radiant warmer on? Do we have our plastic wrap, the thermal mattress, warm humidified gases? Those are things we might want to consider as we get ready. We need to make sure we have a PPV device that can provide PEEP and CPAP. Um, we need tightly sized masks. That can always be a challenge in these tiny babies. And if we have to intubate, we want to make sure we have the right size blade and endotracheal tubes available to us. Um, there are no laryngeal masks in the U.S. at least um, for a baby that is this small. Um, we only have a size one. I'm really hoping over the next five years that we can get industry to tackle making some smaller um, laryngeal mask airways. Um, and then we have to adjust our starting oxygen concentration. Um, we need an FiO2 in our guidelines. We say between room air and 30% for these preterm babies. Um, pulse oximetry needs to be available. And then, very importantly, we need to have with our OB team regarding plans for deferred cord, cord clamping if the infant is active at delivery. So those are the things that we're doing to get ready. And then at birth, again, once we the baby is out and the OB can make some assessment of how that baby is doing, we again have to converse again about whether we're going ahead with our plan to perform the delayed cord clamping. <clears throat> so I wanted to show you the ILCOR review on deferred cord clamping. 
And this just came out in publication two months ago. The lead author was Seidler. Um, it was a systematic review um, done by the ILCOR group. It included 23 randomized controlled trials, which had over 3,500 babies in it. Um, and we looked at survival to discharge, of which there was moderate certainty evidence that showed um, it just touched one. The relative risk was 1.02 with a confidence interval of 1 to 1.04. So 18 per thousand more infants survived if delayed cord clamping was used compared to early cord clamping. Um, and then the confidence interval was somewhere between 0 to 36 more survived per 1,000. So um, that review also found that delayed cord clamping improves hematocrit at 24 and 7 days of life, which results in less need for blood transfusions. <clears throat> and that the delayed cord clamping improves, improves blood pressure, resulting in less use of pressors. There was no difference found in that review regarding severe interventricular hemorrhage, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, or necrotizing enterocolitis. And no difference, we did look for potential harm in the mother, um, and we found no difference in maternal postpartum hemorrhage or infections. So the guidelines for the US for deferred cord clamping, we said that deferred cord clamping for at least 30 seconds is reasonable for preterm newborns who do not require resuscitation. They have to be showing some signs of, of, of breathing effort at least. Um, and if so, then we place them skin to skin with the mother or the OB can securely hold them in a warm, dry towel or blanket if it's a cesarean delivery. Very preterm newborns can be wrapped in warm blankets or the polyethylene plastic while this is ongoing. Um, but it, there should be no delay if the infant appears lifeless or if the placental circulation was disrupted. If this was a stat delivery for abruption or cord avulsion, bleeding placenta previa, bleeding vasa previa, then obviously that makes no sense to stay connected to the placenta and we would not recommend deferred clamping in that case. And just to point out, you guys know this, it takes a lot of really great communication and teamwork with the OBs to get this done, especially in the tiny babies. Okay, what about cord milking? You know, it's very appealing as it can be done quickly so that resuscitation could commence quickly for those babies who aren't breathing. And so we did look at this as well in 2020 in an ILCOR review. Um, cord milking, it was a cord milking versus immediate cord clamping. And um, we had 13 randomized controlled trials involving over 1,100 infants. Um, there was no difference in survival to discharge. That was moderate certainty evidence. Cord milking did improve the hematocrit at 24 hours and reduce the need for blood transfusion and use of inotropic support. There was no difference in maternal postpartum hemorrhage or infection. Um, so compared to immediate cord clamping, there might be some advantages, but what about cord milking compared to deferred cord clamping? Well, you guys know, may be aware that there was some really um, concerning animal data that has come out um, in 2017 from the Australian group with Stuart Hooper. Um, this particular study was led by um, Blank et al. in his group. And they took 126 day preterm fetal lambs. They exteriorize them, they intubate them, they put in all these lines so they can measure every pressure you'd be interested in. And then they randomized them to four different cord management strategies. And then they looked at the umbilical pulmonary and cerebral blood flows and the arterial blood pressures. And so they were measuring the hemodynamic effects of cord milking on carotid artery blood pressure and, and blood flow. And I think you can see here, one of the things that's very concerning is they were doing this milking. Um, there were fluctuations in the carotid artery pressure and flow. Whereas if um, in this case, they were actually comparing it, I'm showing you here, physiologic based cord clamping where they got the, the lamb breathing before they clamped. Um, and you can see they don't have that kind of fluctuation. And of course, when we see fluctuation in blood pressure in the brain, that's when we start to get worried that we're going to induce interventricular hemorrhage. So this study, I think, brought up some animal data that was concerning. And then um, an epithetheria who's done so much work in this area of cord management in preterm babies um, started his trial. And in his trial, 
he, um, this was a multinational randomized non-inferiority trial. He was looking at babies that were from 23 to 31 weeks gestation. Um, and he was randomizing them to either umbilical cord managing, they did it four times, they would milk the cord, or deferred cord clamping for at least 60 seconds. And they were stratified by mode of delivery, gestational age, um, they had a lower gestational age strata, 23 to 27 weeks, so equal numbers of the intervention versus control in that group, and the higher strata of 28 to 31 weeks gestation. And they had planned to enroll 1,500 babies, but the trial got halted after 474 were enrolled for safety concerns. There was no difference in the primary outcome of death or severe IVH for the whole population. But what they were very concerned about, again, was these very preterm babies at 23 to 27 weeks who would have been at most risk for interventricular hemorrhage. And here he showed us a whole bunch of data. You know, there was no difference in the um, whether the babies were crying. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, that's not quite true. There was there was a difference in the timing of the cord clamp, which makes sense. You're going to clamp much faster if, because cord meckling is faster than sitting there for 60 seconds, letting the deferred clamping go on. And, and so um, with the deferred cord clamping, a lot of those babies were already crying or breathing um, before the cord clamping. And then the rest of the things, you know, the APGAR scores weren't different. Um, whether they needed PPV wasn't different. The rates of intubation or hemoglobins at delivery were pretty concordant. But here's the issue, severe IVH, grade three or grade four, it was only 4% in the deferred cord clamping group, but it was 22% in the umbilical cord management group. So very significant difference and very concerning because this was the most severe grade of IVH where this difference was found. And so that is what halted the trial. So the guidelines in 2020 for cord milking for preterm infants in the U.S., we said that in infants born 28, so these bigger preterm babies, 28 to 33 weeks gestational age, who do not require immediate resuscitation birth, we suggest inter tact cord milking is a reasonable alternative to deferred cord clamping. It's a weak recommendation with moderate certainty of evidence. But we suggest against intact cord milking for infants born at less than 28 weeks gestation. Weak recommendation, very low certainty of evidence. Okay, so what about deferred cord clamping for those babies who are non-vigorous, who need resuscitation? Um, again, we started, we are aware of the, the animal work from Stuart Hooper's lab where um, he has shown that in these preterm animals, these lambs um, who are fully instrumented, that um, he randomized them to bringing them out and doing immediate cord clamping and then ventilating them if they didn't start breathing versus bringing them out making sure that ventilation was established, so keeping them on placental circulation until the lungs were inflated and ventilation was established. Um, for, and they did that ventilation for two minutes after, after birth. And I just wanna show you some of these parameters from the animal work on heart rate, the left ventricular output, carotid artery pressure and flow. And so the unventilated group, so this group that gets the immediate cord clamping and then they start to resuscitate them versus is in the dark circles. And in the open circles, you see the ventilated uh, um, uh, first animals. Um, so you guys know that 30 to 50% of cardiac output goes to the placenta. And so with the immediate cord clamping before the lung was ventilated, that resulted in unstable carotid pressures. You can see pressure going up and down and here's the heart rate. Um, and it resulted in a lot of bradycardia. Whereas the deferred cord clamping until the lungs had been ventilated, that allowed a much smoother transition. Here's the carotid pressure, here's the heart rate, it never drops. And it appears that the umbilical flow maintains ventricular preload until the pulmonary blood flow is established. And so if you can ventilate those lungs, get the pulmonary blood flow going before you clamp, you prevent the carotid pressure spike and the drop in heart rate, which could be, makes sense physiologically. So now there are at least three ongoing international trials that are examining delayed cord clamping while resuscitation commences with a mobile resuscitation trolley pulled up next to the mother. And so we don't have the results of those studies yet, but ILCOR is waiting. We're scanning the literature constantly. And as soon as that evidence is available, we will redo our systematic um, review on cord management um, and see whether this strategy 
would have a, a significant enough certainty of evidence that we would recommend that as a treatment recommendation. Okay, let's get back to our baby. So at delivery, our baby has some initial respiratory effort, but very poor tone. Um, delayed or deferred cord clamping is attempted for at least 60 seconds, and then the baby is brought to the radiant warmer. Okay, so in the US guidelines, after you have done that, the deferred cord clamping, and you get to the radiant warmer, you are supposed to warm and maintain normal temperature position the airway, clear secretions if it's needed, dry and stimulate. So we, why are premature babies at particular risk for hypothermia? Well, they have that immature epidermal barrier with a very high evaporative heat loss. They have limited subcutaneous fat and increased surface area to weight ratio and ineffective thermo, um, shivering thermogenesis. And so I wanna show you the ILCOR review um, in 2020, that reaffirmed the findings of the prior 2015 systematic review regarding temperature stabilization. There were 36 observational studies that demonstrated increased risk of mortality associated with hypothermia at admission. Hypothermic infants have increased morbidities such as hypoglycemia, respiratory distress, interventricular hemorrhage, and late onset sepsis. And the recommendation is that temperature should be monitored and maintained in the delivery room between 36.5 and 37.5 degrees Celsius after delivery. Um, just to highlight some of that evidence, um, you can see that in this study from LabTook, um, as the gestational age goes down, um, the chances for a low admission temperature, both less than 35 degrees Celsius and even those less than 36 degrees Celsius, is incredibly high. So for our 27 weeker in this data, old data set, um, there would be an 11% chance, one out of 10 would have come in very cold, but 40% were coming in hypothermic less than 36. And for every one degree Celsius decrease in admission temperature, the odds of late onset sepsis went up by 11%, and the odds of death went up by 28%. You know, this was way back in 2007, and, and since 2010 guidelines, we've put a lot of effort both into the guidelines as well as the educational programs of the NRP to try to show these different interventions that you guys can use to improve um, temperature stabilization in the hopes that we can then improve mortality. Um, in a more contemporary cohort, um, that we just published in 2018. Um, this cohort had over 3,000 infants less than 29 weeks gestation. And we compared it to the old data set. So the old data set where I showed you that 30% increase in mortality if they were cold, um, that came from 2002 to 2003. That's in the lighter bars and the darker bars are the more contemporary cohort. And so I think you can see that with those educational programs in the US and the NRP putting this stress in, we have way fewer babies nowadays coming in very cold and more babies in the normal temperature um, range. Although we do have some increase in babies getting too warm. So you have to be careful. And we have fewer lower admission temperatures, but more elevated temperatures. Um, and there's, but there still is an inverse association, um, even in this more contemporary cohort between temperature and mortality risk. So it's still a, a big deal that we need to pay a lot of attention to. Now, there are many evidence-based strategies to help with temperature stabilization of the preterm infant. Um, you can increase your ambient temperature in the operating room or delivery room, and that seems to help. This is data we did at our, our own trial at Parkland, um, where we, randomized the operating rooms to two different temperature ranges. The standard management arm um, was quite cold, but you have to understand Texas is hot and we have a deep abiding passion for air conditioning and our surgeons don't like to be hot. And this was the standard 67 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Celsius, this is cold. And we just, we, we got them to agree to turn the temperature up to at least 23 degrees Celsius. And with that, we had many less babies coming in um, after birth who were hypothermic and in both in just less than 36.5 degrees Celsius, but also reduced the number of moderate to severe hypothermic infants just by maintaining a better warm environment around the baby. Um, 
There's also been recently randomized trials of conditioned or unconditioned gases for stabilizing preterm infants at birth. So this is something that might be important for our 27 weeker that we're talking about. Um, there's some trials that looked at infants less than 30 weeks gestation. They were randomized trials where they um, randomized to heated humidified gases versus just cold, dry gas for respiratory support in the delivery room. And found that there were fewer infants in the heated humidified group who were hypothermic on admission to the NICU. So this is a strategy you might want to consider if you're having a lot of difficulties with lots of babies who are still cold. Um, in this trial, they reduced that from 27%, uh, excuse me, from 43% hypothermic to 27% when they used the heated humidified gases. Um, obviously, combinations of strategies are likely to be needed. For all newborns, we recommend in the US that the environmental temperature be at least 23 to 25 degrees Celsius, that you use warm blankets for drying and hats. Um, for newborns who require resuscitation, you obviously need a radiant warmer. You could consider the use of warm humidified gases. And for the preemies, definitely consider the polyethylene occlusive wrapping or the heated sodium acetate warming mattresses. Um, you gotta monitor the temperature in the delivery room and adjust as needed, because if you use all of those things, you can really overdo it and cause babies to be too hot. And that is not helpful either. Okay, so for our baby, we don't skimp on any of those initial steps in the algorithm. We provide warmth. We've got a warm room, the radiant warmer, the thermal mattress, the plastic poncho when we put a wool hat on the baby's head. We position the baby in the open airway position and clear the airway if needed. You don't suction every baby, baby only if they're drowning in their secretions or if they're completely limp and apneic and not clearing their own. And, and then we offer stimulation. Okay, so in our algorithm, if the baby is breathing and maintaining their heart rate, then we come over to this right side of the algorithm and we ask, is the, lab is the breathing labored or is there persistent cyanosis? And if the answer to that is yes, then we might consider the use of supplementary oxygen and CPAP if needed. So what is the evidence for that? Um, if the heart rate and respiratory are adequate, but there's increased work of breathing or the perception of cyanosis, then CPAP can be considered. CPAP may help establish the functional residual capacity. Now CPAP can be delivered with the flow inflating bag or a T-piece resuscitator, but you're not gonna be able to do that with a self-inflating bag. So the evidence for CPAP um, for preterm babies really came from three RCTs. And remember back in the old, old days, we used to intubate all these tiny babies. And then these trials came out, which involved over 2000 babies. And there seemed to be a potential benefit for reducing death or BPD if you would at least try to stabilize them on CPAP rather than just automatically intubating them like we used to do in the old days. There was no advantage for death alone, BPD alone, air leak, severe IVH, NEC, or ROP. Um, the treatment recommendation was that for spontaneously breathing preterm infants with respiratory distress requiring respiratory support in the delivery room, we suggest initial use of CPAP rather than intubation and PPV. So in our baby, we try to do that because remember we saw some respiratory effort. We put CPAP on, we get the pulse ox placed on the right hand, and now we're assessing is there adequate respiratory effort and heart rate? And so when we listen, initially, we hear a heart rate of 50. And so that tells us, yes, the baby may be trying to breathe, but it's ineffective because if we had effective ventilation, the heart rate would pop up and would stabilize. And so we've done our assessment here in our algorithm. All assessments are in these pink kind of hexagons. Um, and so then we have to move down the algorithm to start considering PPV. So in our baby, we start at my institution, we use the T-piece. Um, and in the US, the guidelines are that for a preterm baby, you can set the pressure between 20 and 25. We use 25 over five on the T-piece for our preterm babies at Parkland, and that's within the US guidelines. And um, we set the oxygen to 30%. Now, other places that we're gonna hear from today um, may use initially rather than immediately starting PPV, they may use some degree of a sustained inflation. And so with that controversy and knowing that we had different practices and guidelines across the world, in 2020, we did a systematic review on the use of sustained inflations in the delivery room. 
And here's the PICO question as we set it out in ILCOR. For newborn infants who receive positive pressure ventilation due to bradycardia or ineffective respirations at birth, does the initiation of PPV with a sustained inflation more than one second compared to initiation of PPV with intermittent inflations lasting one second or less per breath, does that result in a difference in death before discharge, which we considered a critical outcome? And then we also looked at other important secondary outcomes like death in the delivery room, air leaks, need for mechanical ventilation, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, severe interventricular hemorrhage, and a few others. So in that systematic review, which was done by, uh, led by Vishal Kapadia and published in Pediatrics um, in 2021, there were nine additional RCTs compared to the last review that we had done in 2015. With the critical primary outcome of death before discharge from the hospital, there was 1,500 babies that we could look at. It was considered low certainty evidence, and there was a relative risk of 1.09 with a confidence interval that crossed one, so no statistical difference. And there was also no significant impact on critical and important secondary outcomes. There was no difference in death in the delivery room, early need for mechanical ventilation, IVH, or BPD. We did do an a priori, we had planned it beforehand, subgroup analysis for the smallest babies, the newborns less than 28 weeks gestational age. And there again, when we looked at the critical outcome of death before discharge, the data came from five RCTs. There were 852 babies. Again, it was low certainty evidence, but here there was more concern. The relative risk for death before discharge was 1.38 and it touched the confidence interval touched one. So there was the chance that sustained inflation would, could potentially be harmful to those tiniest babies. So the treatment recommendation said for preterm newborns who receive positive pressure ventilation for bradycardia or ineffective respirations of birth, we suggest against the routine use of initial sustained inflations greater than five seconds it was a weak recommendation, low certainty of evidence. We said that a sustained inflation could still be considered in research settings. We need more data. It's low, cert, very low certainty of evidence. For term or late preterm infants who receive PPV for bradycardia or ineffective respirations at birth, it was not possible to recommend any specific duration for initial inflation, inflations due to very low confidence in the effect estimates. There was almost no data for us to look at in late preterm or term babies. So we did not, um, we do not use sustained inflation in the US. We would just start the PPV. So the next question is, is one PPV device better than another for delivering PEEP? Um, so which device do you want to use? We had a trial from Dawson. Um, in Australia that we could look at in here. She's looking at the positive, the, the PEEP, the positive end expiratory pressure along the x-axis. And we've got a T-piece, a self-inflating bag with a PEEP valve and a flow inflating bag. And really um, it looked like the, the, the ability to maintain PEEP really was easiest with the T-piece. Um, so the guidelines for the use of PEEP um, in newborn infants receiving PPV, it may be reasonable to provide PEEP um, based on a 2015 systematic review in CoStar. Um, we had studies from Edgardo Shields Group and Ruth Ginsburg down in Brazil um, to look at. And in those studies, um, the TPs seemed to have some additional advantages. In Edgardo's study, the TPs group had fewer babies with a heart rate less than 100 beats per minute at two minutes fewer intubated, fewer with BPD, and fewer days on oxygen. Ginsburg's study um, was an observational study um, and looked at um, the use of T-piece versus self-inflating bag, so a device that could provide PEEP versus a device that couldn't. Um, there were 1,900, over 1,900 babies to look at, and in their study, which is very large, T-piece use associate, was associated with a greater chance of survival without major morbidity. So um, we do think that there are advantages to a T-piece for the preterm baby, and that is certainly something to consider in the U.S. If you, if you can provide that. There are resource limitations, though. It's not like T-pieces are cheap, uh, but that would be our suggestion. Okay, what about oxygen? We said we were going to turn our oxygen to 30% um, for preterm infants less than 35 weeks. ILCOR did that review. Um, 
we said initiate resuscitation with a low oxygen concentration. It's a weak recommendation, very low certainty of evidence. Um, it came from 10 RCTs and four observational studies. There were over 5,600 babies to look at, but we found no statistically significant benefit or harm in preventing mortality when beginning resuscitation with low oxygen compared to high oxygen. The relative risk was 0.83 and the confidence interval crossed one. Um, and so the task force in discussions of what do we do with this, we valued not exposing preterm newborns to additional oxygen without a proven benefit for the critical or important outcomes. And so because of that, we said you got to balance the need to give sufficient oxygen to correct the hypoxemic state, but we also want to avoid excessive oxygen exposure. The goal of the current strategy um, for resuscitation is to titrate that oxygen amount to achieve a target sat. And the target um, saturation for delivery room resuscitation, we said we would approximate the median preductal saturation of the healthy term babies, even for preterm infants. And we recognize, we don't know that that's the best for um, preterm babies, but that was what we have to go on so far as information from term babies. Okay, now, even when that baby, remember that baby had a heart rate of 50, even when that baby was very bradycardic, the goal is to first focus on effective PPV. So the heart rate is low, but it's not like we're going to start pressing on the heart. We need to provide effective positive pressure ventilation. The data from the U.S., and a lot of this comes from Parkland Hospital, where I am, because we have this huge delivery population. For 999 out of every 1,000 infants who are bradycardic, if you will bag them, that will be all that is needed. The heart rate will respond to effective positive pressure ventilation. And the indications for cardiac compressions um, for neonatal CPR have not changed. Chest compressions are only indicated when the heart rate remains below 60 despite providing the initial steps and at least 30 seconds of effective assisted ventilation, which means you have to first, before you jump to compressions, focus on the ventilation corrective steps. We call that the Mr. Sopa steps, and I'm going to take you through those in just a minute. Um, that you go through to achieve inflation of the lung first. And that includes, if necessary, placing an advanced airway before moving on to compressions. Um, and we really have this focus because you guys know, once chest compressions are started, they are very likely to compete with effective ventilation. Um, you just lose all sense of how, whether you're getting chest rise, et cetera, and you've got to get that ventilation in place. Um, so our team starts focusing on effective ventilation and they are working on the ventilation corrective steps. And as I mentioned, we use this um, algorithm of Mr. Sopa. They've already put their pull socks on. They're using those pressures of 25 over five with the TPs. And they can see on the, the TPs gauge that they're hitting those pressures that they wanted, which means they don't have very significant mask leak, which is good. They put the baby in the sniffing position. They have the mouth open and they still see poor chest rise. And those steps, the mask, reposition, suction, and open the mouth are the first four steps. If you still can't get anywhere, then you need to increase the pressure. And that's what they did. They took the PIP up to 30 centimeters of water pressure, um, but the heart rate now is just faint and 40 rising. They're not getting anywhere. And the final step to improve that ventilation is the A, consideration of an advanced airway. Um, and in our algorithm, as I'm going to show you in a minute, you also need at that point to consider putting the leads on, ECG leads on. But that last step of advanced airway, they get ready to intubate because there's no LMA available. So they intubate with a 2.5 ET tube. Okay, so now they've got their tube in. Here's the, the section of the algorithm we're in. Um, if not already done, if the heart rate's now below 60, you're going to... Um, Intubate, you must intubate if you haven't already done that, but you can consider now chest compressions potentially if the heart rate stays low. You can see that if you're going to start compressions, you need to turn the oxygen to 100%, put the ECG monitor on, and you need to consider whether you're going to need an emergency line. So our team is adjusting the tube to the proper depth. They hear equal breath sounds. They see chest rise, so they're hopeful, 
And this is one of those rare one out of a thousand cases where the heart rate doesn't respond to that, what would otherwise appear to be effective PPV. And so now um, with that knowledge, they have uh, to um, turn the oxygen from room air to 100% or 30% to 100% and initiate compressions. Um, and they do that from the head of the bed. You can see the tube is in. Here's the RT who's holding the tube and manning the, the T-piece resuscitator. The doctor who did the intubation is now free to um, put their hands on the chest. Um, and now you can see these people over here at the side, they can come in and they have access to the cord um, to potentially consider putting in a line. Now, as far as the recommendations for cardiac compressions, these have not changed at all since 2015. Um, you're to compress to a depth of one-third the AP diameter. You compress the lower one-third of the sternum, making sure you're above the xiphoid process. Um, we recommend the two-thumb technique. Even our brave leaders in the United States know that you got to use your two thumbs, not two fingers. Um, it's a three-to-one compression to ventilation ratio for asphyxial arrest. And you coordinate those compressions and ventilations to avoid simultaneous delivery. And really importantly, and something I think neonatologists need to work on a lot, is you need to avoid frequent interruptions in the compressions. Now, that head of the bed technique allows the continuous two-thumb um, use, uh, the two-thumb technique. Um, once an airway is established and secure, that provider can give compressions from the head of the bed. The potential advantages are several. You know, when you're standing at the head of the bed like that, as you can see from this um, provider here, the arms are in a much more neutral position than if you were at the side and leaning in over the baby, trying to get your arms wrapped around them to do the compressions. Um, and the umbilical access is available um, while you continue that, that two thumb technique. In the old days, you know, people used to say, oh, well, during line placement, I got to switch to the two finger technique. And that two finger technique, when you look at the data for that, it results in no forward blood flow. You do not want to be using two fingers. Um, and you've got all that space on the side now um, for somebody to come in and put in your line. So our team has compressions in progress. They're working on the emergent UVC. The heart rate is still 40 beats per minute. So the next part of the algorithm remains that if despite compressions and ventilation, your heart rate's below 60, that it's time to consider the use of IV epinephrine. Our drugs, we have it so much easier than our adult counterparts. All we gotta remember is epinephrine and consider volume if you're in the right situation. Um, IV is preferred, preferred, IO access, intraosseous access is okay as well. The dose remains 0.01 to 0.03 milligrams per kilo. You can try endotracheal delivery while achieving your IV access. If you're gonna do that, you need to use a higher dose, 0.05 um, to 1.1 milligrams per kilo. Um, now that was based, we did for the first time ever, we did a systematic review looking, trying to find evidence for these doses that we use in neonatal resuscitation, which frankly were just taken from the adults um, without much in the way of neonatal data. When we did this um, systematic review most recently, um, Tetsuya Isayama, who you're gonna hear from in a minute, led this group in the ILCOR review. We asked the question among neonates of any gestation, um, less than 28 days of age who have no detected cardiac output or who have a systole or a heart rate less than 60 despite ventilation, and chest compressions, does any non-standard dose interval or route of epinephrine compared to the standard doses that we've used for a long time, this 0.01 to 0.03 milligrams per kilo intravenous at intervals of every three to five minutes, change the outcome of mortality before hospital discharge? We also looked at some secondary outcomes, including failure to achieve return of spontaneous circulation and time to return of spontaneous circulation. There were only two eligible studies, and these were not randomized. These were observational studies. Um, the critical outcome was mortality before discharge. There were only 50 babies to look at. Very, if, if we had a designation of very, very, we would have put it, very low certainty of evidence. The relative risk was 1.03, and the confidence interval spanned one, so no difference. Um, this came from 
my own institution um, led by one of my fellows at the time, Cecilia Holling, and that was the only study available to look at that was comparing um, endotracheal route to uh, the IV route. And statistically, there was not really a difference, but when you, um, and even when you looked at the secondary outcomes, there were a few more babies because there were two studies we could look at for others, like a failure to achieve ROSC, um, no difference, time to ROSC, no difference. But importantly, when you looked at time to ROSC, um, the, the ROSC, the return of spontaneous circulation was two minutes later when you used the initial endotracheal route compared to the intravascular route. Um, and so that, that was interesting. Now, we did at ILCOR take into account um, some animal work because we have so little human data to go on. And what we looked at was this paper from Valley et al. This is Satyan Luxury Rusama's group. Um, and they used a transitioning newborn lamb model. They induced asystole by cord occlusion. And after five minutes of asystole, the lambs were resuscitated. And they randomized them to receive epinephrine via a jugular line that was directly in the right atria versus a low, v, low UVC line like we use clinically or tracheally. And the tracheal route had much slower absorption and a reduced peak plasma concentration. And that delayed the return of spontaneous circulation. And, and that group here is these open triangles. And here you can see the jugular line, which is delivering it right into the heart very quick. Um, the umbilical low line also fairly quick, maybe not as quick as a right atrial line, obviously. But look how much longer it takes um, to get any rise in the epinephrine level when you deliver it tracheally. So we really took that into account in addition um, as we were justifying what we said. And we said, if the heart rate has not increased to 60 beats per minute or greater after optimizing ventilation and chest compressions, we suggest the administration of intravascular epinephrine, 0.01 to 0.03. And it is a weak recommendation with very low certainty evidence. If intravascular access is not yet available, we suggest administering endotracheal epinephrine at a larger dose than the dose used for the intravascular administration. Again, a weak recommendation, very low certainty of evidence. In making these recommendations, the task force considered the fact that the very limited human newborn data did not demonstrate greater efficacy of endotracheal versus intravascular epinephrine. The animal study was critical to emphasize that in an excellent animal model of neonatal transition following asphyxia, intravascular delivery of epinephrine through the UVC achieved the higher peak plasma concentrations and faster. It achieved return of spontaneous circulation faster compared to the endotracheal route. So back to our baby, two minutes after that first dose of IV epinephrine goes in on the ECG, the heart rate is now 80 beats per minute. So we're making some progress. The team stops to listen and can confirm that that heart rate is greater than 60 and rising. The compressions are then stopped, but PPV is continued. The OBs are reporting as they deliver the placenta that they do see a 50% abruption, which may explain the cardiovascular collapse and acidemia that must be in this baby. Um, the cord gas gets sent and the baby is quickly taken to the NICU for further stabilization. So um, I hope I've kind of taken you through the US algorithm in some ways. Again, where we're just focused on a very preterm baby. There might be a few different caveats about term babies, but I hope you see that this algorithm, we based it on the rigorous ILCOR science reviews when we could, um, when a review had been done. Each resuscitation council across the world can take that ILCOR science review and adapt it to account for their own resources, their own customs, et cetera. So there will always be some minor differences, but our goal at ILCOR is to try to come to some consensus on how certain the science is and really also to call out where the major gaps in the science are to try to call the international science, resuscitation science community to action to do the studies that we need to improve our algorithms. And I'll stop there. And I think we're gonna hear from some of our counterparts across the world about how they interpreted things perhaps a little differently. Thank you. 
Thank you, Myra. Um, that was an amazing talk. Uh, you took us through a lot of um, very interesting um, process and uh, also primary and uh, secondary data. So it was really amazing. Um, my, my name is Charles Roer. I'm a neonatologist from Oxford in the UK. Um, it's a great privilege and honor to work with Myra on the ILCO Council, and I'm also the NLS co-chair uh, for science for the European Resuscitation Council. Let me briefly uh, express my gratitude to be here with you in this room together um, with such elaborate speakers from all around the world. And it's really amazing that Bernard has uh, very kindly uh, put us all together and given us the forum to present the new guidelines um, and to discuss with you what you think of them and how you think you're going to uh, put them into practice in your local hospital or in your region. Myra took us very well through the baseline science for resuscitation research and uh, the beauty of her talk also illustrates how the American Heart Association um, has adapted the ILCO guidelines. Now for me it's a pleasure to um, take you through how the European Resuscitation Council has adopted the ILCO recommendations into their 2020-2021 guidelines. I have no relevant conflict of interest to declare for this talk. I'll take you through the five top messages how we roll out the guidelines uh, in Europe. First of all, starting from the baby, um, very much in a sense like Myra took us through her talk, we um, promote delayed cord clamping uh, for preterm and term infants, uh, recognizing that the Benefits, at least in the high-income countries, lie very much on the side of the preterm infant. However, there are perceivable benefits also for the term-born infants. Secondly, as Myra pointed out, it's really important not to let babies of any gestation get cold. So temperature management is key throughout every aspect of neonatal stabilization and resuscitation. Thirdly, it's really important to focus on effective airway management because airway management is paramount and leads over cardiovascular transition. A fast heart rate indicates that the baby's probably got well aerated lungs and it's the better, more sensitive measure of sufficient maneuvers during resuscitation than anything else. Fourthly, and Myra took us very nicely through the Mr. Soper steps, which the, uh, of course, American Heart Association and American Academy of Pediatrics promotes. It's really important to focus on the simple things that make airway management simpler and easier and effective in babies. And lastly, again, beautifully illustrated by Myra, chest compressions definitely are the very end of a resuscitation process. And uh, I reiterate what Myra taught us from her local experience, 99, 999 out of 1,000 babies will respond to effective airway management and only one per thousand will require chest compression. So when you do chest compression, be sure that you've all established your breathing well and that you've got chest rise, etc because otherwise, what's the point? So um, I'll go into a little bit more detail why uh, we came to the, um, the um, different steps. My, my slides aren't advancing. That's why I am trying to sort out. Uh, sorry, I might have to ask Bernard and team to help me with my slides, please. Sorry, could somebody, f I don't hear anything either. So I have a slight slide problem here. Ah, thank you. They've jumped forward, sorry. I, I apologize for, for this little mishap. We've been to these five slides. The fifth, uh, in this next section of my talk, I will talk a little bit more about the depth of the evidence or illustrate um, why we have interpreted the ILCO guide in a, uh, in a specific way. 
So we've recognized the um, hard work by the evidence review through ILCO um, and the primary data. The European Resuscitation Council suggests court, delaying cord clamping for at least 60 seconds um, for preterm and term-born infants, as we recognize it has hematological and circulatory benefits for babies of all gestational ages, in particular the preterm infant. So Myra, um, Bernard asked us to illustrate the differences. Um, Myra illustrated that the WHO um, defines delaying cord clamping at 30 seconds or more. Uh, in the European Resuscitation Council, we found significant and sufficient evidence to promote the 60 seconds as a um, reasonable minimal time for delaying cord clamping. Again, thanks to the previous speaker, we've learned that the practice of umbilical cord milking may have some, um, res some caveats for the smaller gestational infants, those less than 28 weeks of gestation. We have acknowledged the study by uh, Carteria et al. and have um, therefore gone with the ILCO recommendation to support the notion that cord milking may be performed in those infants greater than 28 weeks of gestation. However, to be mindful not to do the umbilical cord milking in those infants who are less than that gestational age. Again, without losing too much time, um, we are in full concordance with the ILCO recommendation to keep babies warm and stimulate. We recognize in primary studies from Arianta Passes group, the group around Peter Davis and the group around um, groups in Zurich, that stimulating babies um, is key. And although we've already said it in many iterations of the resuscitation guidelines, us neonatal teams in the delivery room are actually not doing as much stimulation as we should. And we reiterate that it's really important to stimulate the baby to breathe by all sorts of kind little mechanisms, feet flicking, back rubbing, and talking to the baby to actually get them to breathe. The work by Laptuk et al. taught us that if babies lose body temperature during the resuscitative and stabilization process, that their outcomes decrease, and that is by significant almost 30% worse outcomes per centigrade of body temperature lost during birth and admission to NICU. So it's really important to keep babies warm. For the babies of less than 32 weeks of gestation, we found so, so enough evidence to suggest to wrap these babies in polyethylene bean wraps, but always use a radiant warmer in conjunction with that. The Next piece of um, block of evidence review is to do with the assessment of heart rate and breathing. Obviously, a baby in respiratory distress will either be completely apneic or significantly grunting, which indicates that the baby needs some help. As said before, the heart rate is a good indicator of the direction of travel of, for instance, also lung aeration and oxygenation. We support the use of pulse oximeters wherever available to assess oxygenation status and heart rate. And where available, particularly in circumstances where resuscitation may be required, an ECG will give um, sufficient uptake for heart rate and um, reliable information. The key recommendations are, and it cannot be stressed enough, to start respiratory support in each baby that indicates respiratory distress or is apneic. For the preterm infants in particular, we promote the use of CPAP. Monitoring is key when providing some form of respiratory support. Pulse oximetry in most cases is sufficient. And where no pulse oximetry is available, regular assessment of heart rate 
um, is important and the target heart rate is above 100 a minute. As to target oxygen saturations, we have not changed our guidance where we still target an oxygen saturation measured by pulse oximetry on the right hand or risk, so preductal saturations of 85 at 5 minutes and 90% at around 10 minutes of age. It's important to call for help early when required. Lastly, how to provide airway and breathing support. As indicated before, most babies need a little bit of help, a little bit of well-fitted mask CPAP and a little bit of oxygen support where needed to transition nicely. It is important to get the head in the right position in order to prevent the occlusion of the upper airway it is important to give CPAP in the smaller babies for in particular and in those babies completely apneic and failing respiratory transition. You'll see that the European Resuscitation Council, slightly differently from um, the American Heart Association, promotes the use of five slightly prolonged inflation breaths. We do this as there was um, some evidence that these so-called prolonged inflation breaths assist babies in their spontaneous breathing efforts. These are not sustained inflations. We recognize the limitations for su uh, suggesting sustained inflations, um, but we also recognize the lack of any evidence suggesting harm or need for practice change in the European resuscitation guidelines. Therefore, we maintained with the previous suggestion to give a set of five inflation breaths um, for babies who are apneic. The inflation pressures to be used in babies are the same as in the American Heart Association as advised by ILCOR, 30 centimeters for term-born infants and this is a change to previous guidance, 25 for the preterm infants. So all in all, the suggestion has gone to higher inflation pressures. It's important to, ch to choose the right kind of face mask um, and always to have babies um, in the neutral head position. Suctioning is only advised if there is um, very clear obstruction of the airway through a lot of fluid um, and if neither effective face mask um, inflation pressures at starting pressures of 30 to 25 depending on gestational age uh, lead to chest rise it is advised to increase the inflation pressures to reposition the mask uh, on the baby's face to use a two-hand technique with a jaw thrust to optimize um, the jaw position and uh, to open the neonatal airway. And if any of these fail, then um, it may be advised to use a higher degree of um, airway like a laryngeal mask or an ET tube. I will not go into greater detail um, with regards to chest compressions because we are in 100% concordance with the suggestions by ILCOR and the uh, interpretation by the American Heart Association that chest compressions are rarely needed. If required, should be done when we have an established open airway, um, should be done together with 100% oxygen and um, if we come down in the algorithm to the point where we think that chest compressions are required because of persistent bradycardia, then we uh, suggest a three to one inflation to um, chest uh, compression ratio. And we uh, also advise the use of uh, epinephrine either through the umbilical or an intraosseous route. So these are the uh, key recommendations and a uh, slightly expansion of the background. Myra has already alerted you to the ILCOR um, publication in Circulation, Pediatrics or Resuscitation. 
and the European Resuscitation Guidelines are found in the publication of um, Resuscitation Journal. You can see um, on this right-hand side of my slide that we have a international representation from um, centers um, broadly across Europe with 13 co-authors um, who were split up into working group with uh, regards to specific themes, but who all agreed on the um, overall resuscitation and stabilization guides as published here in March 2021. So synergies and differences between ILCO and the European resuscitation guidelines are quickly uh, established here. We acknowledge that ILCO um, is the mother publication of um, the evidence review with regards to neonatal resuscitation measures. Um, we've heard from Myra very nicely how the evidence is classified, uh, the need for further uh, evidence is uh, assessed and publicized. We um, are grateful to the very um, meticulous process through ILCO and we're also very grateful that uh, the ERC members uh, have a continuous representation on the ILCO Council. This is just a quick snapshot which illustrates uh, the, the broad international representation that ILCO um, has in the Neonatal Life Support Task Force, uh, which we are grateful for Myra's uh, amazing leadership here. We, to give a few examples, um, and these have already been shown by Myra et al., uh, the evidence reviews that led to the um, very detailed practice uh, recommendations in both ILCO, AHA, European Resuscitation Council, I'm also very sure in the Japanese Resuscitation Council, are uh, a set of um, meticulously done systematic reviews and meta-analyses which have gone into these guidelines. Um, so just to highlight the slight differences between the ILCO recommendation and the ERC guidelines, one is a slight obvious difference in our algorithm where we've put in a box which shows the absolute minimum details for uh, differences in resuscitation approach for preterm infants, um, where we highlight a few steps and maneuvers for those infants born at less than 32 weeks gestation. We also did already talk about the differences in the approach for airway management and provision of breaths during resuscitation slash stabilization, where the European Resuscitation Council promotes the five inflation breaths compared to ILCO and American Heart, where it's a continuous intermittent positive pressure ventilation provided um, by PEEP enabled devices. And maybe a slight difference um, only in, in the sense of wording, um, but we acknowledge the great work by um, Myra and her group in Texas that chest compressions are very rarely required and that we've moved our suggestion for um, intubating babies during chest compressions a little bit further down the line uh, than the ILCO algorithm suggests, but I'm sure it's only a technical issue. So to summarize, we do consider the ILCO document as the mother document of all resuscitation councils. Um, the ERC is put in a term and preterm bracket for um, the core, in, in the core um, elements of the resuscitation. We, different to ILCO, um, promote the use of the inflation breaths and um, we have used very careful wording calling to consider intubation a little bit later than maybe in the ILCO um, algorithm. This brings me to um, the one difference that uh, you also uh, would have noticed and Myra has alluded to, the lack of laryngeal mask airways for the tiniest babies, which makes it difficult to advocate for their use. However, for babies of greater weight than 1200 gram, laryngeal mask is available and we've explicitly 
um, called for the use of laryngeal mask um, if no person is available who is sufficiently skilled in neonatal intubation. Um, and we do advise all teams, of course, to be trained in the use of laryngeal mask as well as neonatal intubation. My slides seem to not forward. Oh, yeah. Thank you for helping. Um, this slide comes from Myra, uh, very kindly provided, and just highlights the American Heart Association's um, interpretation of the ILCO guidelines and has been gone through in detail by Myra. Therefore, I, I flick through this and I come to the end of my presentation, giving you a little outlook. It's been a while that um, I assessed the differences between the American Heart, ILCO and the European Resuscitation Council's guidance. And I'm very grateful to see that we've managed to have greater parallelism and more overlap um, and synergy between the different interpretations of the same evidence. We are, as Europeans, very grateful to be well represented on the ILCO Council um, which helps us greatly in understanding the reasoning behind the guidance and uh, the incorporation into the European Resuscitation Council guidance. Um, we've seen a great deal of improved communication uh, between the different councils um, and sessions like these to help us uh, greatly also to uh, roll out the reasons for similarities and differences um, between regional guidelines and I'm pretty sure that, sorry, this jumped a little bit on the side, that we will see further alignment of the recommendation in future years to come because, as Myra has um, so beautifully illustrated, the evidence um, is available worldwide, the interpretation may be regionally different, but um, based on the strength of the evidence, the interpretation should be conclusive. I thank you very much, Bernard, again, for asking me to refer the European resuscitation guidelines here. And I'm really looking forward to um, having some question and answer time between us here in this uh, virtual room. Thank you very much. Hi. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, for your excellent presentation. And we crossed the Atlantic first from the uh, States to UK. And now we're going to cross the ocean again and we go directly to Japan. And this uh, will cover almost all of the world. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce the last but not least speaker, Professor Tetsuya Is Isiyama. Professor Isiyama is the head of the Division of Neonatology at the National Center for Child Health and Development in Tokyo, Japan. He's a member of the Japanese Neonatal Cardiopulmonary Resuscitation Council. Thank you, Tetsuya, for sharing us some of your experience. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Bernard, uh, for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to present uh, Japanese guideline. Uh, as uh, Myra and Charles uh, presented uh, American and uh, European guideline, um, following that, uh, I will uh, I would like to talk about the Japanese uh, program, neonatal resuscitation program. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah. So I, I, first, uh, I briefly uh, talk about the situation of the Japanese uh, neonatal uh, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. We call the our uh, program uh, NCPR uh, in Japan. And uh, after that, uh, I will briefly uh, talk about the algorithm of Japanese algorithm, NCPR algorithms. And at the end, uh, I talk about the difference uh, the, of the uh, neonatal resuscitation uh, between Japan and the USA and the Europe. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. As uh, already Myra uh, explained very well, uh, ILCOR is composed composed of several uh, resuscitation council worldwide, and uh, Japan uh, involved in this ILCOR activity since uh, 2006 as a member of uh, uh, resuscitation Council of Asia, and uh, we are uh, we are uh, working together with the uh, North American and the European and the other areas uh, council members uh, to develop the uh, international resuscitation guideline 
uh, for neonates. Uh, uh, as you all know, the 2020, uh, this ILCOR, International Liaison Committee of Research Station ILCOR, uh, published uh, the uh, guide uh, recommendation uh, for the neonatal research station in the circulation. And based on this uh, common uh, guideline, uh, USA and Europe and Japan and the other countries or regions uh, develop our own guidelines. And uh, in Japan, since 2000, I think 2010, uh, 2005, uh, we uh, make our own uh, Japanese neonatal research station uh, guideline and the textbook, as you can see here. And then this is an overview of the algorithm. Uh, left side is a European uh, algorithm, and the uh, center is a, a USA, uh, North America, and the right side is a Japan. And uh, as you can see, I, I think this structure is um, uh, Europe and the USA, as Charles already explained, a little bit different, the structure. The, in the Europe, uh, I think uh, algorithm is, uh, looks like a more uh, from top to bottom, the uh, one line. But the uh, for the U in the USA and the Japan, we have a two a kind of two line. So the one one and the, the other stabilized pathway. So that is a little bit uh, different structure. So I think uh, Japanese uh, algorithm is uh, a little bit similar to the USA USA one and the U European. Uh, algorithms are slightly different, and uh, that's one that was already explained by the Charles. And uh, before uh, going to the algorithm, I want to talk about the situation of the neonatal research station in Japan uh, briefly. So this is uh, the left side graph showing the number of the instructors and the providers of this NCPR program in Japan. As you can see, over time. Uh, the number, in, so since 2006, uh, when we uh, joined the ILCOR, the number of the uh, instructor and the provider rapidly increasing now. And uh, as of 2019, uh, we have uh, uh, 72,000 uh, providers. On the right side, you can see the, uh, there, uh, we have uh, 3,200 instructors uh, who are in, across Japan. So. I think uh, anybody in Japan can have a training uh, in their uh, their site uh, close to the their site. So, so, and the, uh, this graph showing the bar, uh, birthplace in Japan uh, over time. Uh, very long time ago, uh, more than fifty years ago, um, uh, most of the delivery uh, occurred at home. Uh, however, uh, from to the, uh, seven, uh, 1950 to 1970, the Japanese health system uh, rapidly changed. And at that time, uh, the bus place uh, dramatically changed from home to the hospital. But uh, as you can see, uh, still currently, still now, uh, I think about uh, half of the uh, baby born at the hospital. And the other half of the baby uh, born at the obstetric clinic, not the hospital. So that is, uh, I think, uh, maybe different from the, uh, some, of the, some of the European country and uh, I think USA. And uh, the, uh, not pro the, what this mean? The, this uh, this uh, data show, uh, come from the uh, Dr. Kunikata's data from Pediatrics International. And uh, as you can see, the uh, the obstetrics hospital and clinic, they have an oxygen piping and a pulp, pu uh, pulse oximeter. However, they, uh, they, uh, less than half of the clinics or hospital, they don't have a, a oxygen blender. So I think uh, adjusting oxygen is a little bit difficult for them. Still, uh, in, in 2015. And uh, <clears throat> gradually the uh, NCPR provider uh, increasing. But uh, uh, most of the hospital have uh, some uh, provider, but uh, not all uh, members of the obstetrics uh, department, uh, they are not trained uh, this NCPR program. Um, for the CPAP use, uh, as you can see here, uh, uh, still 2015, less than half of the hospital are using the CPAP in, in the neonatal research station. So I think, uh, so, <clears throat> This is a situation. So, 
I think half of the uh, births uh, happening in this obstetric clinic. It's uh, that's is not that have not enough. I think device and the equipment for the neonatal research station. And uh, <clears throat> next, uh, who is that? Uh, this NCPR program providers and the instructors in Japan. And uh, as you can see, the uh, forty-six percent is a mid, uh, midwives and thirty. Uh, uh, percent is the nurses. So most of the providers of this program is uh, midwives and the nurses. And uh, I think other, uh, uh, and the next uh, large part is the obstetrician is a seven, per, seven percent. And the neonatologist and the pediatrician is only six percent of the provider. But for the instructors uh, of this NCPR program in Japan, uh, approximately one third is obstetrician and one third is a neonatologist or pediatrician, and one third is a midwife and the nurses. I think this is because I think many uh, uh, delivery uh, happening in the obstetric clinic. So I think obstetrician and the midwives and the nurses, uh, they are the, I think, the first responder to the neonatal research station. So I think they, uh, uh, they, they try to, uh, train themselves uh, for this uh, NCPR program. So next, uh, I, I will go through the uh, Japanese algorithm. So <clears throat> already, I think Charles uh, compared the USA and the Europe. So I, uh, to simplify the talk, I try to compare the Japan and the USA mainly, and sometimes uh, including the Europe uh, one. So as you can, as I said, the structure of the algorithm is uh, uh, relatively similar uh, between Japan and the USA. And uh, we have a uh, life-saving steps, the uh, left left line and the right side. Uh, once the baby have a, a, a little bit stabilized, uh, stabilized, uh, I think uh, steps. And uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, very close to the USA one. The first algorithm is uh, for, uh, first before the birth. We check that uh, uh, we do the team briefing and uh, <laughs> personal protect, uh, pro pro protective equipment and uh, equipment check. And after birth, uh, based on the preterm, weak respiration, uh, weak tone, uh, we go to the, uh, we uh, have to warm and open airway, uh, dry and stimulate the baby. This is a very similar. And after that, we check the breathing and heart rate. And, uh, and after the, uh, if the baby have an apnea or a heart rate less than 100, uh, we uh, have to provide the pro uh, PPV, positive pressure ventilation. And at this stage, uh, we have to put the saturation monitoring, uh, pulse oximetry. And uh, we consider uh, ECG monitoring. Uh, this is uh, not mandatory yet. Because I think uh, many uh, some of the hospital, especially obstetric clinics, uh, they don't have a uh, ECD uh, monitor uh, uh, to use in the neonatal research station. So that is a. I think uh, in the future we try. Uh, I think uh, we, uh, it may change, but uh, currently uh, we only consider ECD if available. And uh, next we check the heart rate. And if heart rate is less than 60, uh, we go to the PPV and the chest compression. And also we increase the oxygen. But I think that, uh, very similar to the other USA and the European guideline, before the chest cramp compression, uh, we emphasize that we have to make sure the ventilation is adequate. So if the, uh, if the people don't think that ventilation is not uh, enough, uh, adequate, uh, I, we recommend uh, not going to the chest compression. Uh, before that going chest compression, we have to make sure that we have to take a how to, correcting step for the ventilation, like uh, Mr. Sopa, as uh, Myra and Charles, uh, Charles already talked. And also we consider the intubation at this stage uh, when, before the going uh, advancing to the chest compression. And after that, still, uh, if the baby heart rate remained and under 60, uh, we consider adrenaline. Again, I uh, we add this uh, the consider here. That means we don't make this adrenaline mandatory. 
So that, uh, that is a kind of a consideration. Uh, some hospitals are not ready to prepare uh, adrenaline quickly uh, for the neonatal resuscitation uh, in, uh, across Japan. So I think uh, we, uh, we are a little bit increase the emphasis of the adrenaline uh, in 2020 compared with the tw 2015. However, we uh, we still don't make the adrenaline mandatory, but uh, we, we recommend to give the adrenaline, especially in the tertiary, tertiary center where the pediatrician and the uh, uh, very trained uh, personnel are present. But I think uh, overall that algorithm is very similar to the USA. Uh, algorithm. And uh, this is a stabilization, uh, stabilization steps. And uh, this is also uh, very similar to the USA algorithm. Uh, only s slight difference is uh, <laughs> at the bottom, uh, we can see uh, if we, this labored breathing or cyanosis, uh, this both continue, we may consider uh, PP, uh, positive pressure ventilation again here because if the, the baby uh, uh, have a, uh, both labored breathing and uh, cyanosis, uh, we may consider PPV and uh, may, we may consider intubation. So this is, a, a, we, we are a little more detail about uh, the kind of this stabilization process, I think compared with the USA one. So next I want to talk about the difference, uh, main difference between the, uh, Japan, USA, European guidelines. I think uh, I checked the uh, uh, I checked the uh, many aspects uh, for this presentation, but uh, actually, as already Charles talked, we we don't have uh, so many difference between the uh, algorithm and between the program. I think uh, one I think a uh, large difference uh, between the Japan and the USA and Europe is uh, umbilical cord management. I will explain that. As already Myra and Charles talked, and the uh, American Heart Association uh, recommend for both term and preterm infant who do not require resuscitation at birth, it may be reasonable to delay cold clamping for longer than 30 seconds. And uh, for infant born at less than 28 weeks of gestation, cold milking is not recommended. This is a USA recommendation. And the Europe, uh, clamping after at, at least 60 seconds is recommended, ideally after the lungs are aerated. I think this is a recommendation for both, both preterm and uh, term infant. I think the uh, same in U, uh, as to USA. And uh, also, I think they recommended this uh, ideally after the lungs are aerated. It's a little bit advanced, I think. And uh, also, uh, Europe, uh, where delayed cold clamping is not possible, a uh, cold milking should be considered in infant uh, more than 28 weeks gestation. So again, they recommend the cold milking uh, for the uh, more mature baby. However, they don't, do not recommend uh, for the infant uh, less than 28 weeks. Oh, sorry. Uh, however, in still in 2020, uh, we have a lot of the discussion, but we still recommend for preterm infant born at 24 to 28 weeks gestation, cold milking is recommended. This is in Japan. And uh, the, the, so delayed cold clamping is not recommended for term or late preterm infant. It's a, uh, maybe it's a little bit, uh, how to say, uh, my writing is not good. Uh, I think we are not recommended, but uh, we didn't mention about the uh, delayed cold clamping for term and the late preterm infant. So we are not actively recommending delayed cold clamping for term and the late preterm infant. We are only recommending uh, cold milking uh, for the very very preterm infant, less than 28 weeks. So this is a very different, a, a different, a, a different uh, point. I think that the, the reason why we are, how to say, interpret the same result uh, a little bit differently from USA and uh, Europe is uh, I, I will explain. And the uh, first, uh, for the code management for the term and the late preterm infant. And uh, I think uh, already Myra showed this uh, systematic review. Uh, uh, our ILCOM uh, member uh, involved in this systematic review and uh, by Dr. Go Marshall. Um, uh, this, uh, the delayed cold clamping uh, compared with early cold, early cold clamping increases the hemoglobin at 24 
hours of birth. And also may increase the ferritin at three to six months. This, this was not statistically significant, but I kind of, uh, 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 not, uh, but uh, uh, how to say, uh, the suggestion of the increase, uh, possi uh, potential of the increase of the ferritin. However, at the same time, the same systematic review uh, provided the data for the <laughs> potential increase of the hyperbilirubinemia uh, treated with the hot phototherapy. This is, again, this is not statistically significant, but uh, again, there are some concern of the increasing uh, hyperbilirubinemia. So the interpretation of the result is a little bit different in Japan. Uh, and uh, uh, furthermore, if we see the subgroup analysis, uh, more than 36 weeks uh, gestational age, so term infant, uh, the delayed cold clamping increase, significantly increase uh, the hyperbilirubinemia uh, treated with the phototherapy. Uh, although this subgroup analysis was uh, not statistically significant uh, based on the interaction, but uh, still there are some concern. So in Japan, uh, we the, uh, the I think um, because Japanese population have a high risk of the higher risk of the jaundice compared with the I think uh, Western country, so that is the reason why uh, Japan has concern about this increase of the hyperbilirubinemia. So we kind of balance this uh, harm, uh, potential harm uh, of the, from the hyperbilirinemia and the potential benefit uh, from the increasing hemoglobin and ferritin. And uh, we, we thought uh, still uh, we, are, we have uh, some concerns. So we don't recommend, we don't actively recommend. Actually, many uh, clinic in Japan, especially midwives, uh, they, they, they are, they try to do the delayed cold clamping uh, actively, but uh, we are not we are not prohibit or me, we are not suggesting do not do that thing. But uh, we are not actively recommending the delayed cold clamping for the term or late preterm infant because of this concern for the hyperbilirubinemia. And the next is for the preterm infant. <laughs> I'm sorry, I removed one slide here. Uh, Actually, I put the uh, slide here uh, from the systematic review for the preterm infant, uh, the same for, from the pediatrics. Uh, so uh, that's the, already Myra explained that Dr. Schreiter's, uh, uh, Dr. Seidler's uh, systematic review uh, published in the pediatrics. Uh, they compare the umbilical cord and the early, uh, late, uh, late cold clamping and the early cold clamping and the uh, cold milking. And the, their result is uh, um, compared to early cold clamping, uh, delayed cold clamping and intact cold milking may slightly improve survival. So uh, delayed cold clamping and the intact cold milking may <laughs> increase the survival, but uh, uh, both are compatible. Uh, with no effect, so uh, can be no effect. So uh, it may increase the survival, but it may not be effective. So, and uh, that result is a uh, very uh, very similar between the uh, delayed cold clamping and uh, intact cold milking. And uh, as you can see, this uh, right side of this slide uh, in the systematic review, uh, we have uh, the uh, they divided the cold clamping management into these four management, only cold clamping and the delayed cold clamping and the intact cold milking and cut cold milking. And uh, I think uh, for some of the audience may have a difficulty to differentiate between intact cold milking and cold, cut cold milking. But I think this differentiation is very important. And uh, uh, this, uh, and uh, I think uh, the re main reason why the USA and the Europe uh, gu uh, guideline don't recommend uh, uh, cold milking for infant less than 28 weeks is uh, because of this Dr. Kateria's uh, large randomized control trial already uh, uh, explained in the uh, Myra, by Myra. And uh, they are, they are, 
uh, how to say, a big impact result was this. This, uh, this is a result for the severe intracranial, intraventricular hemorrhage. And uh, as you can see, uh, overall, uh, intact, cord, intact cord milking increased the uh, severe intraventricular hemorrhage uh, compared with the delayed cord clamping. And uh, furthermore, if you, we see the subgroup, uh, especially for the 23 to 27 weeks gestation, uh, the difference, uh, huge difference uh, for the severe intraventricular hemorrhage. Uh, for this very small ba preterm babies, uh, intact cord milking increased, uh, so have had the 22% of the rate of the severe intraventricular hemorrhage. I think uh, uh, we, uh, I understand that this uh, is a very concern. Uh, this may, uh, this, uh, this show the risk of the cold milking. But I think uh, uh, one point uh, we, we have to be cautious is that uh, uh, this study is uh, based on the intact cold milking. That is, a, uh, here is a explanation. 20 centimeter of the umbilicus cord was milked during approximately two seconds, allowing the refill and then repeating three more times. That means, that, so if the, we have a cord and uh, pinch and uh, milk and uh, oh sorry uh, he, <laughs> that is difficult open and again pinch and uh, milk and uh, open and the pinch and milk this uh, repeat this four times it's uh, we understand this may cause the uh, lapid fluctuation many times and um, it may increase the interventional hemorrhage but in Japan, uh, what we are doing in Japan is slightly different. And uh, I will show also. Japan used this uh, different method, the cut cord milking. Uh, we don't know the uh, this is gentle or not, but uh, it, we may we we are thinking this is may, more gentle. And uh, and also, Japan actually has a low mortality and a very low uh, low rate of the severe intraventricular vent hemorrhage, especially in very preterm infant compared with the other country. That is the reason, the reason why, uh, uh, for the reluctance for us to, how to say, uh, adopt a, a new method, delayed cold clamping for us. Uh, that is the reason. So I will show you this. Uh, this is a Japanese method of the cut cold mixing. Already uh, umbilical cold cut and the resuscitation was already initiated and the, uh, remove the twist and uh, slowly uh, milk the code only once. So this is the way uh, we are doing the, uh, maybe we, I can show you again. So this is uh, removing the twist and uh, already uh, we are starting resuscitation and the baby are crying and uh, slowly push the blood. So. <laughs> this method is uh, <clears throat> probably uh, some of you already <laughs> watched the video from the Dr. Kateria, uh, their trial. Their, uh, their, I think, the trial is a little bit, uh, milking is uh, many times uh, a little bit more rapid. So that's may, uh, that would be uh, very different. So, and the, this is a situation that all the uh, cold uh, blood transfusion uh, in Japan, uh, data from the uh, Neonatal Research Network of Japan. And uh, by gestation age, you can see th this is a, a cold blood transfusion. Mainly this is a cold milking. Uh, delayed, cold brain, uh, de uh, delayed cold clamping is uh, not uh, popular yet in Japan. So mo most of this uh, cold blood transfusion is a cold milking. And as you can see, <laughs> For 25 weeks, uh, still uh, not not all baby we are uh, we are doing, but uh, uh, around 30 to 50 percent of the baby receiving the cold blood transfusion. And as I said, uh, uh, this is uh, the data from the International Network uh, INEO uh, comparing the outcomes: severe intraventricular hemorrhage or preventricular leukomalacia comparing the many countries. 
And uh, as you can see, Japan has a relatively uh, one of the lowest uh, rate of the uh, intraventricular, severe intraventricular hemorrhage, even if uh, we are performing the, this uh, co uh, codon milking. And uh, we did not experience increase of the intraventricular hemorrhage with cut codon milking. And uh, also a multi center trial of cut codon milking in Japan. Uh, Num, uh, infant, one, for, including 144 infant, showed that degrees of severe intraventricular hemorrhage uh, with cut cold milking compared with the early cold clamping. So, uh, this result is not published yet, and uh, this was uh, already presented in the uh, Japanese conference. But uh, Dr. Hosono is the primary investigator, and I, I think he will publish soon this result. So, I think we 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 already explain uh, experiencing uh, we. Uh, the, uh, we didn't experience the increase the, of the severe IVH uh, 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 seen in the Dr. Kateria's trial. That is the reason why we are still sticking sticking to the umbilical cord milking. Of course, we we have a concern uh, of the potential increase of the IVH. So we have to be cl closely monitoring uh, the trend of the these outcomes, and we have to be considered in the future. Uh, okay, so next uh, go to the FI, uh, initial F, uh, oxygen uh, uh, concentration and the target saturation. And uh, as you can see, the initial FiO2 uh, is not so different between Japan, USA, and uh, European. Uh, European guidelines are slightly uh, more detailed. <laughs> and the target saturation is a number is a different between the, I think, uh, USA, Europe, and Japan. But uh, I think mm, overall similar. Uh, a little bit, Japan is a one minute 60%, uh, three minutes 70%, five minutes 80%, and uh, 10 minutes 90%. So I think, uh, personally, I think Japan is a little bit simpler uh, compared with the other guideline. But I, uh, I don't know <laughs> others, how others think of this. And this is a medication, comparing the medication part. And again, medication is not so different between the USA, Europe, and Japan. I think Japan mentioned about the sodium bicarbonate, uh, but Europe also mentioned about the glucose. Uh, that's, those were not uh, mentioned in the USA uh, algorithm. And the one small difference uh, in Japanese uh, neonatal resuscitation is that uh, uh, usually, uh, I think uh, USA, Europe, I believe uh, umbilical venous catheter, UVC, is uh, the first choice. As this is the same in Japan. We, we recommend uh, UVC, uh, the first uh, choice. However, uh, at the same time, we, uh, how to say, uh, clearly uh, describe this peripheral intravenous line, a PIV, is also a good alternative to UVC. And in fact, uh, many, many NICUs and many people, neonatologists, prefer uh, PIV uh, rather than UVC because I think uh, many people are good at uh, placing a UV, uh, PIV very quickly uh, compared with the UVC. Uh, so I think in Japan, many places, uh, first we try the PIV first, and uh, if it's difficult, uh, change to the UVC. It's a very common practice in Japan. And the other very, very small difference of the tech uh, guideline is uh, uh, tube size. And uh, the recommendation of uh, tube size, uh, as you can see in Japan, we, we uh, mentioned about that very small endotracheal tube, uh, 2.0 millimeter inner diameter for very small baby. I think uh, in the USA and the Europe, they didn't mention about this very small ET tube. But in Japan, uh, when we uh, resuscitate 22, 23 weeks uh, and uh, less than 500 or less than 400 gram, very small baby, uh, sometimes it's very, uh, it's a little difficult to uh, intubate using the 2.5 millimeter uh, ET tube. So uh, we uh, always, uh, usually many places, uh, we prepare the 2.0 millimeter and uh, often we use 2.0 millimeter ET tube for very small baby. Because it's easy to intubate, and uh, that's a little bit different. So this is the last last slide, and 
this is a little different from the real research station, more like a stabilization. But this graph uh, came from the uh, INEO, again, INEO data already published in the neonatology. And uh, this graph showing the what's the, uh, the ventilation management for the uh, very small baby, 20 to 28 weeks uh, com uh, in Japan compared with the other INEO countries. And uh, this red, red graph, uh, so the top is a 23 to 24 weeks, and the middle is a 25 to 26, and the bottom is a 27 to 28 weeks. And uh, this uh, red color indicated the in invasive ventilation, mechanical ventilation. If the baby is on the CPAP and using the uh, less than 40% oxygen. <coughs> so as you can see, the in, uh, for, for many countries, uh, very small baby, 23, 24 weeks, uh, most of the country uh, intubate the baby and they put on the ventilation. That is a similar. But uh, only in Japan, 25, 27 weeks, even if the more, more mature baby, uh, we intubate the baby and put on the ventilation. Uh, compared with the other country uh, try, uh, starting using the CPAP or Insure or LISA, more non-invasive ventilation. So this is a kind of indicating uh, Japan, we are more tend to intubate the baby, even if in the research station, probably compared with the other country. Okay, so in summary, approximately half of the births occurred in obstetrics and clinics in Japan. And then many Japanese uh, NCPI providers are nurses and midwives. <coughs> Japanese NCPI does not um, actively recommending does not actively recommend uh, dread cold clamping for term or late preterm infants. And the Japanese NCPI still recommend cut cold milking for very preterm infant, 24 to 28 weeks. And the peripheral intraven uh, intravenous uh, IV. Uh, can be alternative to UVC. And a very small uh, 2.0 millimeter ETT tube is used for extremely small babies. So this, uh, this is the end of the presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. I would like to thank all the speakers, Professor Waiko, Professor Oroi, Professor Isiyama, for being here for, with us today and sharing their experience. To a wonderful and enlightening presentation. Now we will read the survey that we did in the beginning, and, the, and we, see, we can see the results on the polling. So I will I ask you again just to fill the survey, and we will need the, your cooperation after you heard the, our speakers. I will encourage you to answer, it's anonymous. We'll just get the results by percentage. Please feel free and Okay, we're going to give you a few seconds more to finish it. We have a few responders. For the last ones that you want to share their experience with us. Okay, so thank you. Now you can see the results, and you can see that you can. Okay, now you can see the results. The person that uh, voted. So we can see that most of the people are doing a delayed cold clamping. Around 70% of the participants here, 
and just 10% will do and milking we milk the cord some people will do both and almost 4% will do neither so most of the people will do something some some uh, managing of the cord most of the people will do a delay cord clamping okay so we're going to get to the next question question is about monitoring during the newborn resuscitation. Okay, I think the results are very interesting, so let's uh, continue to share your experience with us. Okay, let's go to the results now. So you can see that uh, most of the people will still use the pulse oximeter to, you know, in order to monitor to the resuscitation. And some of the people are still use the, feeling the pulse in the umbilical cord. And there are some people that already are using the electronic cardiac monitor. And um, like, uh, 98% of the of the responders are actually monitoring some kind of monitoring, um, and only 2% don't monitor the baby at all. So let's go to our third question. And this question is about how long will you continue to resuscitate an unresponsive baby uh, during resuscitation. So let's. Uh and this question is about how long will you continue to resuscitate an unresponsive baby uh, during resuscitation? So let's uh, stop voting now. Okay, uh, results are very interesting, even a little bit uh, surprising, I must say. Current uh, NAPE recommendation was uh, about 10 minutes. But, uh, let's see what the audience are practicing. Okay, we're going to give you some more, like 10 seconds to. Enter your vote. And let's go to the results. So we can see here that around half of you are using, using to resuscitate babies for 20 minutes till they will, uh, uh, they will stop um, resuscitating them. And around quarter 
we'll do it uh, for 10 minutes, another quarter, we'll do it at, we'll do resuscitate, still resuscitate, and we'll be very, uh, until even more than 20 minutes trying to resuscitate the babies. Okay, I would like maybe later on the speakers to address this uh, issue as well. And we can go to the last question, which is a, a easier question, I would believe, to answer. And start voting. And would you change your practice after the webinar today? results are very interesting and we hope we did something in this webinar that people are they get something from it I think it's the most important question for us as the organizers and the, the speakers Okay, so we won't let you into suspense more, so we can go to the results. Any other results? So you can see that uh, more than half of you wish will uh, change the practice according to the webinar recommendations, and the quarter won't change, and there's still around the quarter, a fifth of you will actually is not sure about uh, if they're going to change their practice or not after this webinar. I think uh, this will give us, the organizers and again the speakers, that something that we, maybe we can influence about, uh, a little bit about you, for you, give some influence. And now I'm going to get into uh, the questions and answers and section. Um, and I would like to address the all the faculties and about the question about the for how long we would you resuscitate the newborn now? And we saw the results from the audience. And what would you say now? Let's start with uh, Professor Wyckoff, please. So um, I just didn't have time to include all the different systematic reviews, and, and we were focused on a preterm baby case there. But um, we did at ILCOR do a recent systematic review. It was published in Pediatrics. The lead author is Foglia, Liz Foglia. And um, we were looking at this exact question of how long is too long? Um, and of course, in the past, um, the data suggested that when we had done the reviews, you know, 10 years ago, that um, it wasn't really, it, it's a challenging situation. So. What we said in the guidelines and the recommendations was that after 10 minutes of what would otherwise appear to be effective resuscitation, that it that um, you could consider in discussion with family um, stopping your efforts because the majority of the evidence at that time did not show um, good survival and good survival outcomes beyond 10 minutes. Now, it was tricky because the data that exists was all about whether your APGAR score was zero at 10 minutes. But we weren't really happy with that. So we said 10 minutes of effective resuscitation, and it might have taken your team a few minutes to get organized and get things going. However, we most recently re took another look because since that time in 2010, when it was last looked at, there have been many observation, it's, it's observational data, it's coming from randomized controlled trials of hypothermia for severely asphyxiated near-term and term infants. And from those hypothermia trials, there have been multiple reports where they've pulled out the children who had 
APGAR scores of zero in this new era of potential hypothermia as a therapy. And they found that there was a not great, but there were some survivors who had reasonable outcomes and they had gone beyond 10 minutes of resuscitation. Now, it's a very low, very, very low certainty of evidence because you had to survive to get into the NICU to be in the trial of hypothermia. So we have no idea how many babies who had really low, you know, no zero APGAR scores for how many minutes died in the delivery room, and therefore they weren't even a candidate for those trials. But we do know that if you can make it out of the delivery room into the NICU, that there is a group of survivors that had reasonable outcomes. And so I would encourage you to look at that systematic review and the consensus on science and treatment recommendation that came out in 2020 that was based on that review. And we are now suggesting that moving forward, it may be reasonable to use 20 minutes as your mark to say, okay, I've tried for 20 minutes. But again, it's not, oh, you must stop at 20 minutes. It's at 20 minutes, if you have had no sign of life after your efforts, it is reasonable to then start talking to the family and the rest of the team about the potential of stopping the efforts. So that is a change and, and I, was not able to work that into the case that I presented you today. Um, but in the US, US guidelines, we are now putting the 20 minutes as the mark um, potentially for those discussions to happen in the delivery room. Um, Charles and Tetsu, you may wanna comment about if you, term, you know, did something different with that information. Yes, uh, Charles, can you, can you comment about uh, what do you do in Europe? About uh, how long do you resuscitate a newborn? Yeah, you, you, you're right. Um, we, we do, as uh, based on similar evidence, as Myra has explained, uh, we have changed our most recent guidance to suggest to do 20 minutes of effective resuscitation before considering to discontinue. Um, this is based on a systematic literature review that um, was led by Dominic Wilkinson, first author Jennifer McGrath, a while ago in um, 2016. And um, of course, is now um, uh, supported by more data, uh, which Liz Foglia recently published, as uh, Myra said. So um, we are, again, we're in concordance with ILCO, 20 minutes um, of effective resuscitation. And in, in Japan, do you also resuscitate for 20 minutes or? Yeah, I, I, uh, in Japan, the same. I think uh, we, we follow the ILCO guideline, as uh, Myra explained, uh, 20 minutes uh, of the effective resuscitation. Uh, that is a time point we can consider and we can start considering uh, talking with the family about the how to proceed after the uh, what's uh, uh, kind of starting point of the talking uh, with the family, but I, I can I, I cannot uh, tell the overall Japanese how to say overview. But I think in my personal opinion, probably in Japan people are resuscitating more longer, much longer than twenty minutes. That is I I think in fact. But uh, I think guideline is uh, now recommending twenty uh, after twenty minutes we can start the talking with the family about the, how to uh, uh, proceed with the research station. So at least we have the, the bulk of the data on. that we had, uh, I was just going to say the bulk of the evidence that was available to us for review, the, the outcome that was mostly available was survival. And what we really need is a lot more data about survival and neurodevelopmental outcomes. I mean, we have some from these hypothermic trials, but again, that's a somewhat biased population. And of course it didn't include any preterm babies. What we need is for all comers who get CPR for varying lengths of time, to have them followed systematically to two or three years of age, or you know, of course what we really want is school age um, to see how they're doing. And we just don't have the data. dark here, but uh, we have uh, another issue, we have uh, some questions about uh, giving caffeine in the delivery room, does anyone recommend it? Uh, with, uh, again with, uh, so, 
So ILCOR has not yet done a systematic review regarding caffeine um, in the delivery room. And, and I think this is a pretty new practice that has stemmed from some animal work coming out of um, Stuart Hooper and other groups in Australia. Um, but there we have, so we are constantly monitoring the literature to see if enough studies become available that it would warrant us doing a meta-analysis and a consensus on science and treatment recommendation. And I would say it, we just feel like it's, it's still too new for us to tackle it. But we are considering a P cost and tracking the literature for that question. So we have not done it at, at ILCOR, nor have we made any recommendation about that practice for the US guidelines. Um, well, it's a it's a great question. So um, we have recently done a little survey uh, amongst units, and we we see that people that there's a big uptake of caffeine in the treatment of preterm infants, um, preventative treatment of, for um, presumed apneas in preterm infants. Uh, trial that has sort of alerted people to uh, much earlier use than in the in the um, previous literature it's quoted between zero and 72 hours as as you know the cap trial by barbara schmidt indicated for caffeine uh, for uh, preventing apnea in preterm infants the trial that i um uh, worth reading is by decker et al from the group of arian to pass where they gave um, caffeine in the delivery room into the umbilical vein straight after birth and they monitored infants breathing with the use of a respiratory function monitor. Um, they, what, what's clearly shown in, um, in this small um, size trial was that by giving caffeine in the delivery room, preterm babies um, have higher tidal volume so they, they seem to the diaphragmatic function seem to increase and they seem to pull in air uh, at a at a faster speed and at a greater uh, tidal volume um, but it didn't have any significant differences between uh, the groups of ox in terms of oxygenation etc so it's a thought-provoking study of giving caffeine very early um, the outcomes um, in terms of efficacy and safety would need to be looked at at a greater uh, population with um, a randomized control design. Okay, and, uh, and in Japan, do you use caffeine in the delivery room or shortly after birth? <coughs> No, I, I don't think so. I think uh, in Japan, uh, of course, we use the caffeine in the NSU, but I think uh, we, our guideline um, group didn't discuss about the caffeine in the research station room. And uh, I think, I believe uh, there are not so many, uh, very few people uh, uh, considering the caffeine in the research station room. But I think I know the, the, these new studies and I, it's maybe very promising, but uh, I think in Japan, it's not popular. Okay, thank you. We have a few questions about handling meconium here. Uh, I think some people are a little bit uh, uncomfortable with uh, not doing anything special with meconium, uh, especially with, um, with um, unviable babies, as we say here. So would you find that there is new evidence about meconium aspiration and meconium suctioning or meconium doing delivery or resuscitation. Okay, we're going to start in order again from the, the US first. So I'll, I'll start with the ILCOR review. So we did a review on that in 2015, which is why we changed our recommendation to no longer routinely intubate and suction all non virus meconium stained babies. And since 2015, there were two additional randomized trials that were published, as well as one additional fairly good sized observational study um, that reported on outcomes of not um, into in the population where they no longer intubated and suctioned the non-vigorous babies. And so we redid our systematic review and meta-analysis for 2020. And based on that, that continued to support and actually just strengthened the recommendation that routinely intubating and suctioning non-vigorous meconium stained babies is no longer recommended. Now, that being said, we put in a caveat. 
to make sure people understand especially you know thick meconium stained babies do have increased risk for need for positive pressure ventilation so this does not mean that you don't need to call a team to be present at such deliveries we also put in a caveat to remind people that although very rare there is still incidence um, uh, of babies have being obstructed by meconium it's very rare but you should always still stock a meconium aspirator, even though it is no longer the routine that we intubate and suction every non-vigorous meconium stained baby. So for the US guidelines, we continue to support the 2015 guidelines. There was no change there. We don't recommend it as a routine. Okay, uh, any comment from, the, um, from Europe or Japan? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, like Myra said, we, in our local hospital, we, we did a, um, a pre, uh, sorry, a post guidelines, guidance change analysis. And we found that um, upon acting after 2015 in a more restrictive way, um, not intubating routinely for heavily meconium stained lycor, we found that by in, it, it helps to um, introduce positive pressure ventilation and no time is lost with suctioning or intubation. Um, and by performing this practice change, we saw that our unit had less admission of infants with meconium aspiration syndrome. So we found very much that this um, practice change has worked in favor of babies being less sick, uh, presumably because they receive effective positive pressure ventilation sooner than after suctioning slash intubation. So um, we published our results. We recognize the, um, the different studies that Myra has also um, alluded to, and it's the European resuscitation guidance is therefore um, in the same way as ILCO to not routinely suction uh, oral pharynx of meconium stained lycor babies. Yeah, in Japan, yeah, in Japan the same. Uh, we the same. We are not recommending the routine suctioning, but uh, uh, again, the, as Myra said, uh, there are possibility of the uh, airway, airway block, uh, even if the, it's rare. Uh, we may consider the suction. Uh, through the endotracheal tube. I think a little bit of difference between the, uh, from the USA. I'm not sure that Europe, but uh, in Japan, we don't have a meconium aspirator. So usually we intubate the baby. Uh, if the baby have a, a respiratory uh, difficulty, severe dis difficulty, we intubate the baby and then we suction using the uh, bigger suction tube through the ET tube. That is a little bit different from the USA. Okay, there's a question, I think it's long, so they say that um, and the Topida trial found a higher mortality in infants, 28 uh, weeks, who were ventilated with 21% uh, oxygen in the delivery room versus 100% oxygen. The NRP and the ill core are still suggesting 0.21 or 0.3 as the um, is starting with uh, oxygen in immature infants as soon as possible. And would you consider to change it from 21 to 30 percent as the European Association um, Council has done? Okay, um, Mara, can you comment about this? I'll briefly comment, and then I think I'll let Charles because Charles actually led the um, ILCOR review for preterm, right? Charles, we were on preterm oxygenation, right? Yeah. Okay. So. Um, we did a systematic review at ILCOR of the use of initial oxygen, um, which doesn't mean that you're going to stay on that oxygen the whole resuscitation. That's just the initial starting point for preterm babies. And we included the torpedo trial in that data. The torpedo trial had a lot, it was a very biased population, um, very, you know, that the study was stopped early. Um, and even when we included that data in our meta-analysis, there did not seem to be an advantage to using higher oxygen. 
So I think all of our guidelines that stemmed from that CoStar, from ILCOR, all say 21 to 30 percent oxygen. Um, so there's the option of starting with 30 percent. Um, I think we're pretty concordant across the board there. But, um, Charles, do you want to make any comments about the, the systematic review and meta-analysis? Yeah, thanks, Myra. Um, it was indeed um, the first two um, Il the first two ILCO led um, meta analysis and systematic reviews that um, I was part of, and we did um, debate a lot about the uh, different quality of the studies, as Myra said. Um, and we have to acknowledge that we've gone through. Um, of course, as a as a profession, we've gone from uh, advocating 100% oxygen and then through the studies by Saugstadt, Vento and others, been extremely cautious about using high concentration of oxygen and trials like the torpedo trial compared lower concentration of oxygen with higher concentrations of oxygen and didn't find significant differences um, or benefits for higher oxygen use. But as Vento and others have shown in the past, um, there is great concern about oxygen um, for oxygen radical formation, which um, persists up to three weeks in, of life and may cause significant structural uh, DNA damage. Now, this concept of um, of um, oxygen radical formation. Uh, has been reviewed by um, a group uh, in the Netherlands around Arena Pass uh, to Pass with Decker as first author, uh, who've done uh, a small trial of about 60 babies with 30 per group, um, which was published at the time when the systematic review commissioned by ILCO was already closed. And that trial showed that um, for one, that um, they compared room air to 30% with 100% oxygen as initial starting concentration for resuscitating preterm infants. And they actually found um, a sooner onset of spontaneous breathing in the high oxygen group. And they did not find um, any evidence of persistent oxygen radical uh, persistence in the in the babies. Now, this is a very small trial, and um, probably a, a, it's also a very brave trial because the investigators were permitted to use 100% oxygen in a high risk group of infants. Um, so the the results would not be practice changing, but they should be thought provoking, and hopefully pave the way for a new era of randomized control trials, which uh, compare 100% oxygen to lower percentages. But until we have this evidence, um, there is no, we, we don't have any um, grounds to change the resuscitation guidance of advocating a slightly higher than room air um, concentration of oxygen for preterm infants. And clearly, based on the trials of Saugstadt and Vento, stay with room air 21% for the term born infants. Okay, we are planning um, we are planning at ilcor we try to review every we try to review every PCOS in the five year cycle so um, we are going to redo the systematic review in a couple of years um, for oxygen and try to capture any of this new data and hopefully we'll have some additional trial data um, become available soon. So it's not like it's a for everything. We realize the science will change is and, and hopefully we'll get better answers moving forward. Okay, another question. Um, in a baby with obvious hypovolemic shock, like in placental abruption, cold prolapse, etc., do we um, recommend to give epinephrine before giving volume expanders? according to the algorithm. So let's hear first from Japan, because uh, we didn't hear them for the last question. So what do you think about this? Uh, this way? Yeah, that's a little bit tricky. tricky. <clears throat> if the if really uh, the if people know the that's uh, the babies are uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, okay. Oh, sorry. 
uh, if the, the cause of the uh, depression of the baby is a uh, really hypovolemia, the, the, and the giving the volume expander uh, uh, initially may be an option. That is, uh, but uh, I think the so we, our algorithm is uh, first we recommend uh, uh, adrenaline. But uh, that is a usual normal cause if the baby remained heart rate less than 60. Uh, usually we give the adrenaline and uh, uh, we consider the uh, cause of the hypervolt, uh, the, the cause. But I, I think if they really uh, people are confident, it's maybe. But uh, our algorithm is uh, adrenaline first. But I think algorithm is not recommending for all babies, so uh, case by case. So if the people believe that, that uh, if the people find the case, um, really uh, the hypovolemia is a cause of the uh, uh, depression, the initial uh, volume expander may be an option, but that, that is uh, not our, in the, uh, our algorithm and uh, not our program. Okay, Charles, what do you think, what do you think uh, Myra and Charles? Yeah, thanks. I, I I just I concur. The uh, the the difficulty with um, coming up with any recommendation at this uh, at the lower end of the algorithm is that of course uh, very little stems from randomized control trials and most data comes from observational data or as Myra has explained comes from studies which have looked at other. Uh, outcomes um, in, in just integrated a population by which we then extract data from. So um, I think, um, as Satsuya said, we have uh, guidance that suggests a management, but uh, it's up to the individual teams to decide what the pathophysiology um, at this particular baby um, is that leads to the baby's non-response to normal resuscitative measures and um, then the teams need to make that decision. I just would like to reiterate that in, as Myra said, 999 of a thousand babies, um, significant bradycardia can be corrected by um, airway management and what medications we give there during or thereafter um, is largely an extrapolation of either animal data or um, led by the clinician's understanding of the pathophysiological processes. So no clear guidance can be given in one way or the other, it's my belief. Okay, and Myra, I would just like to, this the same. I mean, I think if you know in your heart of hearts or, through direct evidence or based on the extreme paleness of the baby that you think this is a blood loss issue, then you know work on the algorithm, make sure they don't respond to ventilation and then try to get the volume in as soon as possible. However, I do wanna challenge something from the question because I, what I heard was in the case of abruption, and abruption is almost always, except for in the context of trauma, it's almost always maternal blood loss and that baby is just purely asphyxiated in which case you need to focus on the ventilation piece, which will likely take care of the problem. And epinephrine may be beneficial if it's an asphyxiated heart that is run out of energy substrate. So I, 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 I um, you know, if you know it's blood loss, sure, but I don't think of abruption as fetal blood loss. Okay, thank you for this answer. And we have, uh... We have questions about cold milking for uh, uh, Tetsuya. And what, is, what do you say uh, about, what do you do a uh, close cold, uh, uh, clamp cold uh, milking and not an actually unclamped or open cold milking? So Bernard, uh, what's the question? The difference between them, or what is the question? Why, why do you do a closed or clamped cord milking? Why you clamp first the cord and then you milk the cord, and um, instead of just not clamping the cord and just milking it uh, as it is? In Japan, so as as I show shown in my uh, slide, usually we we cut the cord first. So we clamp the cord and uh, cut the cord. And uh, usually we leave the 30, 30 centimeter cord. Uh, I, we ask the obstetrician to leave the cord uh, around the 30 centimeter. And uh, we 
after the clamp, uh, uh, we start the research station uh, for very small baby. And then during the research station, we throw, uh, 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 take, uh, how to say, twist the, uh, uh, slowly uh, milk the cord. That is a way we do. So the cut cord milking is a Japanese way. And uh, I think uh, Dr. Kateria's uh, large trial and many other trial uh, performed using the intact cord milking. That is a uh, cord is connected to the placenta and not cramped. And uh, they do the three to four times uh, cord uh, milking. Uh, and it's a, it's a very, how to say, uh, a little bit rough uh, compared with the only once uh, slow cold milking, cut cold milking in Japan. Uh, can, uh, did I answer? I thank you, Tsutsuya. And now I think we have uh, mm -hmm. time just for one last question. And, and it's about the practice about the LMA, which I think is a bit novelty in this uh, new recommendation. And how do you, you think it should be used um, versus the intubation, intubation process? Okay, so we go first to uh, Myra, please. About using the LMA in the so we did do at ILCOR a systematic review of the use of um, superglottic airways um, in the past. And we are currently, we're in the process of redoing it right now. Um, the group is already well underway. They're going to be presenting their um, evidence tables to, a, to the task force in the next couple of weeks, actually. So we will have more to say about superglottic areas with the most recent evidence available coming from ILCOR in the next year. So it'll come out in the 2022 CoStar that gets released a year from the fall. That being said, I think there is a lot of recognition that there, at least in the United States, and I don't know how it is for everyone else, but a decreasing um, confidence and ability in intubation for many of our providers across the country. They, we, we use so much CPAP in our preterm babies, it's rare that we're intubating them. We no longer intubate the meconium babies. So there's very little opportunity for trainees and providers to learn the skill or practice the skill on a continuing basis. And the, the evidence that I'm aware of thus far from our prior older review is that you know the superglottic airways, it's easier to train people to use them and for them to maintain the skill um, than it is compared to intubation. But, but we need to see that formalized in the grade analysis and systematic review, but that is our sense. I can tell you that on the American side, in the NRP education program for our guidelines, we are increasingly stressing the training of placement of a superglottic airway um, because of this ease in teaching people the skill. But we will have more to say on the science behind that in the coming year. Okay, uh, Charles, any comments about LMA? Yeah, th thanks for that question. It's a great one. Um, actually, we, we've got a, a 99 NICU webinar coming up where Joyce O'Shea, um, who's done a lot of work around the use of laryngeal masks in, pre in, in infant and during intubation, has um, written a very interesting piece in Archives Disease of Childhood, where she uh, clearly lays out the shortcomings of our current neonatal training in training pediatricians to be sufficiently um, experts in intubation and advocates the use of laryngeal masks with the caveats that Myra has alluded to that they are not available in uh, significantly small sizes to be used in babies less than 1200 grams. Um, but for the majority of babies um, between 1200, 1500, 1800 grams, they are a very good alternative to using an ET tube. It's easier to learn. It's a skill that's easy to maintain and they, they are safe for short-term ventilation. So. Um, again, stressing the point that each and every practitioner and unit should train up in the use of LMAs because they are um, very good devices and may bridge uh, the time between the need for um, higher grade airway support and somebody who comes to uh, sufficiently intubate the baby. 
Okay, and what do you do in Japan with LMA? Yeah, I think uh, in Japan, uh, probably compared with the USA and uh, Europe, and uh, LMA is not not so popular yet in Japan. But uh, uh, the, uh, similarly, in, even in Japan, the interest in the LMA uh, increasing, and the people are uh, we are uh, people uh, we are in the guideline also we recommend uh, as an alternative to the NHRK tube. But uh, I found very interesting, uh, as Myra and uh, Charles just mentioned, I think uh, in the USA and the Europe, uh, they, 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 um, it's become a problem for the trainee to have a good experience of the intubation. But uh, uh, I don't know it's good or bad, but in Japan, as, as I explained in my last present, uh, the last slide, in Jap Japanese management is uh, more invasive uh, against to the, how to say, popularity, uh, recent trend. And so we intubate the baby more. So uh, we, we don't have that problem yet currently in Japan. So, uh, so intubation is, uh, I think, same. So we intubate the baby, uh, many baby, and the uh, trainee have a similar training uh, compared with the in the past but uh, uh, LMA is uh, interesting is uh, increasing in Japan too okay so I would like to thank you we had more than uh, 1500 registrants here and if we we have to, if we believe to our last poll question that uh, 75 percent of them will uh, change or consider to change the practice after this webinar I think we did something great here and if we were able to change the practice... Can I ask you a question? Sorry, sorry, yeah? Sorry, what, Maya? So, well, I'm just thinking about, um, you know, changes in practice. It's it, it needs to be a whole team that changes their practice, right? So just, just educate us on, do you have a, a national guideline for your country or how, how does each hospital come up with how they're doing it or do you have your own group that puts out a recommendation or how do you guys deal with resuscitation guidelines and education across your country? In Israel, in Israel I'm happy yes. to say that we use the NLP guidelines. So you have been influenced okay, so in Israel. <laughs> yeah, so we have the 50 second uh, uh, States in the US. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, okay. the, then I, I think yeah. that if you do it uniformly, that'll be great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, not all the participants are from Israel, they are all over the world. So, we have more than 50 countries that are participating here. So, we not all from Israel, we have from Japan, from Asia, from Africa, from all the continents. So don't worry, you were heard all over the world. <laughs> and it's a pity that we can't hear the applause from uh, the audience, but I'm sure that we are all grateful for all the effort that you gave and for the different hours that you had to spend for it. And you have been uh, here for a long time, maybe a little bit longer than you expected, but it's always like this when we enjoy. And really I would like to Thank all the participants in the webinar and you will receive, all the participants will receive a link to a short survey and we will uh, like your, uh, we will appreciate your feedback to, in order to handle more webinars on different uh, topics. And let me remind all of you that the recording of the webinar will be available at the Academy of Neonatology website. You can just uh, Google it and hope to see you in next meetings and take care and stay safe and again thank you all the speakers and from all over the world we were very happy and very honored that you have uh, given us the lectures and you again thank you stay safe and uh, again thank again. you for having us thank you for having us Hi, good morning, afternoon and evening.
we are happy to welcome you all to the webinar about neonatal resuscitation around the world. I am Dr. Barzilai, Chairman of the Academy of Neonatology, Director of the Neonatal Intensive Care Unit at the Shamir Medical Center in Israel. As a disclaimer, I would like to say that I work with TEVA as a consultant and trainer. I'm very honored and happy to open the international webinar on neonatal resuscitation around the world. This webinar will provide a better understanding of neonatal resuscitation and will introduce a new NRP, the new NRP guidelines followed by the latest European and Japanese guidelines. We are fortunate to have with us some of the world experts in this field and hopefully this will help us 